Hello, I am Natalie Pelugiai, California's Labor and Workforce Development Secretary. I want to take a moment to welcome you to the California Workforce Development Board's Prison to Employment Digital Summit. And I also want to thank everyone serving the formerly incarcerated population for paving a pathway toward employment and away from recidivism, even during the pandemic. Our state prison system releases approximately 36,000 people per year, averaging nearly 3,000 a month. This doesn't include people being released from federal prisons or local jails in California. And at any given time, there are also more than 400,000 people on active probation in our 58 counties. California is home to nearly 40 million people, and it is estimated that nearly 8 million of us have some kind of criminal record. These one out of five Californians are affected by countless legal and regulatory barriers to employment and other critical needs for reentry. The numbers are outstanding and they set the table for why we are all here today. I don't think that anybody here truly thinks we're gonna tackle a problem of this magnitude with our initial $37 million investment in prison to employment. However, because of your creativity and finding new ways of meeting people where they are, the important work you have done has helped over 5,000 justice-involved Californians with nearly 100 different types of services to help them obtain employment and earn higher wages since October 2019. Over 1,400 of those participants have already exited the program and entered employment, and we're just getting started. Through occupational training, resume, and job search assistance, as well as assistance for basic needs such as securing right-to-work documents, clothing for job interviews, transportation, housing, and childcare, you have made a transformative difference in the lives of people who have been served through this program. That is why so many of us have dedicated our lives to workforce development, and we have so much more work to do. Your efforts have helped formerly incarcerated individuals train into occupations, including construction, logistics, manufacturing, and hospitality. These are life-changing middle-class jobs made accessible to a population that is often hardest to serve. In addition to the direct services provided with this first of its kind state general fund investment, you've built a local and regional infrastructure for services to continue to be delivered with the next round of funding received in the 21-22 state budget. Our state team continues to do the same partnership work at our level. Together, we'll work and continue to build upon this foundation and find better, more innovative, deeper and impactful ways of system alignment and coordinated service delivery that moves us toward a true sense of economic justice. I thank you again for your tireless efforts in helping to create a California for all. Um. I want to, I have to be very quick because I actually have to jump off to a Senate Budget Committee hearing that also started at nine o'clock and, and I've been getting text messages from Senate staff saying, where the heck, heck are you? Um, so quickly, I'm going to, I'm going to thank uh, jo Joe Flores, uh, Angela Mendebliss, uh, Travis Baker, and the whole California Workforce Development Team for putting this event, this summit together, um, but also just for the great uh, and tremendous support for prison to employment over the years. Um, I want to thank also Curtis Natsuna, uh, who's going to be closing uh, the event off, up, uh, kind of summing things up for us. He's a deputy director here at the California Workforce Development Board. And I think the main inspiration behind P2E when he came to the board uh, just four short years ago. Um, I want to thank Nettie Sablehouse, the governor's office, uh, who really helped drive this work. Um, thanks to all the workforce boards in California, 45 uh, community-based organizations that are working on prison to employment, rehabilitation programs, parole of probation, all of these partnerships in every region of the state doing just tremendous work on the ground. Um, Secretary Kathleen Allison, uh, the, at the California Department of uh, Corrections and Rehabilitation, and of course, Brant, uh, my good friend and our colleague, uh, we've been working very closely on this for the last several years. Uh, Brant's the director of, uh, of the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation Division of Rehabilitative Programs, and I'll, I'll hand it over to uh, Brant in a sec. So the, the damage of mass incarceration, um, slightly more than 36% of California's residents are at or near the poverty level, um, more than a third of our population. According to a Stanford report uh, for EPIC, the Ending Poverty in California, Michael Tubbs' new nonprofit, 
the justice system is arguably the premier poverty generating and disparity generating institution. It reproduces poverty by entangling low income individuals in a system that disrupts their education, employment and family relationships, blocks those with arrest and conviction records from access to jobs, housing and help, uh, imposes fines and fees that undermine uh, their financial stability. And we have criminalized the everyday activities of those who live in poverty, uh, those who lack stable housing, those who struggle with mental health uh, issues, uh, and those who rely on the informal economy because they can't otherwise make ends meet. So this creates a, a vicious cycle and, and a trap. Um, the resulting involvement with the justice system then causes further harm. Um, these disparities uh, generated account for racial and ethnic inequality in labor market outcomes as well. So our, our end game at the California Workforce Development Board uh, with Prison to Employment and all, all of our other program work is to move the needle on equity in California to build a more just economy defined by quality jobs and equity, uh, to realize Governor Newsom's bold vision of a California for all. Uh, economic equity is the best anti-recidivism tool we can hope for, full stop. So in the 2018-2019 state budget uh, included was $37 million. $37 million over three budget years to develop the prison to employment program. Uh, a corrections workforce partnership agreement was developed that includes the California Workforce Development Board, CDCR, uh, the California Prison Industry Authority, and the California Workforce Association, which represents the state's 45 local workforce development boards. Uh, in each region, a workforce board is the grantee on behalf of a broader regional partnership of local boards, community-based organizations, county and state reentry programs. And the goal is to create a sy systemic and ongoing partnership among rehabilitative programs within CDCR and the state's workforce system. So this create, uh, corrections workforce partnership has made huge progress in sewing together an often disjointed patchwork of pre-release and post-release services into what we're now seeing as a very coordinated effort. So despite the challenges that all of you know well uh, with COVID, um, despite everything that was disrupted because of COVID, over 5,000 justice involved Californians have been served by prison to employment. We still have another month to go, so data is still coming in, but I can share that nearly a thousand uh, participants have already earned industry recognized credentials. 2,100 participants uh, have already exited the program and entered unsubsidized employment. And as you'll hear today, directly from some of those participants, those numbers represent real lives. Uh, and there's $20 million in additional a prison to employment funding uh, going out late this spring or possibly early June, but as soon as we can get those dollars out to the partnerships. So to our prison to employment partnerships on the ground, thank you for all your creative and inspired work. Hang in there. Uh, this is very long game stuff. And I'll hand it over to my friend and colleague, Brant Choate. Thank you, Tim. Perhaps I'll speak from the heart a little bit here and give you a little history lesson. About five years ago, I guess, then Governor Brown put some of us leaders within CDCR and some of the leaders within the California Workforce Development Board together in a room and basically locked the door and said, don't come out until you figure it out. And we looked at each other when we first met, not only did we not know each other, but we didn't really know what we were supposed to figure out. And we just knew that we were supposed to get along together when it was all done and come up with a plan where, where we had a better system for reentry for people coming out of jails and prisons in California and a better way for people to connect with employment and training. And so we started there and we learned that we actually had some common goals and that we liked working together. Uh, my people didn't even know what an American Job Center in California was. As we surveyed the field, most people didn't know. And the people from the California Workforce uh, Board didn't really know what happened in a prison, what was going on. So through a series of many visitations to prisons and to 
uh, American job centers and to the field and working with community-based organizations, we learned each other's game and we learned to work together. And then of course, as Tim mentioned, the, the 37 million was put out to the field and that ignited this opportunity for all of us to start working together. And great things happened over the past several years. What we didn't really anticipate is that through the process, we would all become friends. Now, Tim mentioned my friend Brant. Well, that's true. And uh, it's, it's always great for me to have the opportunity to work for, for Tim and his team over there at, at the board. And, and uh, what ended up happening is that just through natural reasons, some of our key players from CDCR and from the board, they moved on and retired. And we lost some of the key leadership, at least at the uh, California headquarters operation that really kept this movement going. And, it, and then COVID happened. And then we had a uh, kind of in the, in the process a change of governor and things kind of died out especially because we're all sequestered in our homes with, with COVID or uh, trying to fight COVID or do, uh, stay away from COVID. Then Curtis and I got together, Curtis Knotts and I, and we, we decided, you know what? We are not gonna let this die. We're gonna keep it alive. And we didn't have any pressure from the outside. There wasn't pressure from the governor's office. There wasn't pressure from uh, either one of our bosses that we knew because of the friendship we'd created and because of all the work that you've done, that this was something really important and special and we didn't want it to die. So we retooled the team. Some of the team uh, you're gonna hear from in the next panel and they've done all the work, but uh, this team is now together to, to make things happen. And, and as Tim mentioned, more money is now coming out to the field. And we're really excited. And we think that what has been rejuvenated here is even uh, better and more robust than what we started with. And it gets better and better every day. So thank you very much for attending today. And we uh, welcome everybody uh, on behalf of California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Thank you. Thank you, Brant, for joining us today. I know Tim had to leave as soon as he got off our screen. Uh, so I want, on behalf of him, uh, we value your partnership here at the state board level with CDCR level. And like how you said, our next panel is going to speak to the Corrections uh, Workforce Task Force collaborative efforts and wins. Uh, but Brant, I know you've been our champion on our uh, your end, and we've been your champions over here on our end. Uh, so we just want to say thank you for joining us. Thank you for helping us kick off this Prison to Employment Summit, minus the little video snafu. But uh, um, but no, we appreciate your hard work, and let's we're on to 2022. So thank you very much, Brant. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Brent. Yeah, so that video welcome message from Secretary Pelugia will be posted on the website so that we can all uh, uh, see that afterwards. Sorry about the snafu. We'll, we'll figure that out going forward. Um, all right. Good morning, everybody. I'm Travis Baker of the P2E field team, along with my colleague, Joe Flores. Good morning. We also have Angela Mendeebles from the P2E implementation team. And welcome to the California Workforce Development Board's Prison to Employment Summit. We have nearly 800 registered guests today, which is a record for us. Uh, and we're so excited to share with you the great work that our grantees have been doing and are doing around the state for formerly incarcerated and justice involved Californians. Uh, today, instead of using Zoom for Q&A uh, for each of our panels, uh, we've made an idea board that we'll use. Uh, please, the, the link will be posted uh, uh, in the chat. I think we're gonna, we're gonna share the screen also of that, that link. Um, so, so please take a moment when you, when you see that link, there it is right there. Uh, in the chat, uh, please take a moment to open that idea board in another window on your computer, because that is the, the idea board is what we'll be using for Q&A. Uh, the idea board lets you submit questions for, for today's panelists. You'll see a different uh, section for each one of the panels that we have coming forward. Uh, and so in addition to submitting questions, you can upvote other people's questions. Uh, uh, and so we will, we will generally start each Q&A session when it comes time for that. Um, by, by, by first beginning with the questions that receive the most upvotes uh, on the idea board. 
Uh, in general, all participants, cameras, and microphones are going to be disabled for today's summit, just as that's part of the logistics of having record number of, uh, of attendees. Uh, as, as you saw with the video earlier, we're kind of figuring things out. This, this, we're, we're really excited for the scale that we're reaching now uh, with our programs. Uh, but so with the exception of, of panelists, uh, cameras and microphones will be disabled, uh, but our panelists will uh, please turn on their cameras and microphones when it is time for their panels to begin. Uh, and before we move on to the panel, I definitely want to give Angela a moment to just uh, uh, talk a little bit about her team and, and, and introduce what's going on today. All right, thank you very much for having me here today. I just want to take a second to um, thank James Hill. He is right now the single analyst working on the prison, prison to employment grant, and he's done a great job taking over um, a lot of extra work. And we appreciate all of your patience with us as we go through modifications, questions, uh, technical assistance. But thank you, James, very much for all your hard work. And we will be having a new analyst starting very soon. So I will introduce her to you guys once she starts. Thanks. Awesome. Awesome. Let's go ahead and kick it off with our uh, first session, our first panel, the Corrections Partnership Task Force. Uh, we have Joseph Piazza uh, from CDCR, Rusty Bechtold from Cal PIA, and Ryan Yatsi from DAPO. If you could go ahead and turn on your videos, please, and, and unmute. There we go. Work. Good morning. I think we're on here. All right. All yeah, right. We all made it. <laughs> Fantastic. Good to see you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Uh, I forgive me. I don't have it right in my paper, guys. I know your titles, but if I could go, if we could go ahead and start with just your name and title, uh, and and then we'll go ahead and get and get uh, started with our with our questions for today. Um, let's see. Uh, please start with Joseph. Good morning. I'm Joseph Piazza. I am the state supervisor for career and technical education. Uh, that sits inside of DRP. You met our director, Dr. Chode, a little earlier. That sits inside of CDCR. Happy to be here today with all of you. Thanks, Joseph. Good to see you. And Rusty. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Rusty Bechtold from California Prison Industry Authority, otherwise known as Cal PIA. Uh, I am the Assistant General Manager of the Workforce Development Branch for PIA. Uh, we're, we're the closing end of uh, Cal PIA with the certifications uh, re-entry um, and some specialized training and uh, also has the joint venture free venture program that allows training with private businesses inside corrections. Thanks. Good morning, Rusty. And Ryan. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Ryan Yahtzee. I'm a parole administrator with the CDCR's Division of Adult Parole Operations. I've been a part of Prison to Employment since its inception pretty much and uh, I oversee our community program staff and a number of our programs across the state. And I'm excited to be here today and thank you all for having us. Thanks, Ryan. All right, uh, so to kick off our, our first question, I think I might start with Joseph and, and tell us a little bit about, uh, about your work and how we're trying to connect um, um, training that individuals receive on the inside uh, with potential employment and jobs that they could receive on the outside. Maybe a little bit about your work with NAB2 that you've done with the Corrections Workforce Partnership and just kind of overviewing um, our efforts there. Thank you very much, Travis. I appreciate that. Um, and I, I wish you all good morning in all the corners of the state. Um, it really is a, um, uh, a great opportunity to connect with people doing important work. Um, that extends what we're trying our mission with inside the institution so that we have a, an easier handoff and success um, for the transition from prison uh, to life outside post incarceration. And so uh, before we get started, I, I do really want to uh, thank um, and compliment uh, Joe Flores and uh, Dr. Travis Baker for the work that they do in the Corrections Workforce Partnership. They are um, just excellent collaborators, as many of you may know from your work with them, and they really do get the full field of play and very committed. So I, I just feel this is the opportunity and the people to say uh, thank you to you, uh, Joe and Travis, for that great work. Um, uh, our work inside of CTE um, is designed to uh, give a person who is formerly incarcerated the opportunity, uh, another reason to avoid recidivating, right, to return to prison. And so what we know is um, if there are 
uh, people who uh, leave prison and they are now uh, working in jobs that are minimum wage and they are struggling once again uh, to take care of themselves financially, as well as possibly um, significant others and or children, uh, that that frustration mounts and sometimes it leads to decisions that were similar to what got them incarcerated to begin with. And so what we try and do is accomplish two things. Uh, our first goal in CTE is to um, help them change their thinking. Oftentimes people come into the institutions uh, with a uh, self-esteem that may be low, their self-concept in terms of their authority over their own lives, their ability to persevere and accomplish goals um, may be non-existent. And their understanding, of course, um, about other people uh, comes from their thinking about themselves. So believe it or not, in our 18 programs, whether it's welding or auto body or uh, manufacturing, uh, our goal, first goal is actually rehabilitative thinking. It's to uh, give people the opportunity to be in a learning environment which, ma which matches their own brain functioning. All of us learn when there are multisensory experiences, when we're learning highly contextualized things that are scaffolded to our advantage, and ultimately that we get a chance to talk to or explain to other people, and CTE is a natural for that. And uh, this is one of the reasons why CTE has um, the best recidivism data of the other programs, um, uh, including academic. College is very promising, it's on its way, um, it's looking pretty good, but the number, the thousands of people that we um, parole who have CTE training and don't return just indicates that it's very natural for the brain. So uh, our goal now, as we are um, improving uh, the quality and standards of our CTE instruction is to work with the California Workforce Development Board and all of you to reach out with that gentle handoff so that we have an easy transition through DAPO with Ryan and his team um, through the California Workforce Development Board. And I was really pleased to see some higher ed representatives here uh, because we're also working on a credit for prior learning plan. And so ultimately we want people who have changed thinking to come out of CTE, but also have a national certification that they can go right into a job and be considered maybe the end of a first year apprenticeship because they have those knowledge and skills. Uh, we have about 320 programs. Uh, we don't have about, three, there's actually 320 programs. Uh, we have 18 different trades in a variety of sectors. Uh, we serve about 12,000 students a year. Um, and that's the, be the beginning of, uh, of what we have. Thanks, Travis. Thanks so much for sharing, Joseph. It's wonderful information. We definitely also just kind of want to take today to, to kind of brag a little bit, you know, to put a little humble brag out there that, that we're really excited. We're really proud of, uh, of, of this work. And, uh, and so thanks for sharing. Uh, our next question I wanted to go to uh, Rusty. Uh, if you could please tell us a little bit about, like, just briefly about the history of um, of the work that we've been doing to get uh, civil service hiring and civil service testing inside of prison, and especially about the most recent civil service hiring event that was held at Solano State Prison. Boy, I, I, <clears throat> I don't think I have enough time to describe it all, but uh, in regards to uh, you know getting the civil service uh, started right. inside of an institution. Um, is, is quite interesting. It started about three years ago, and we've done it a couple of times, but um, I think this uh, final third time, I think we've uh, learned a lot and got it, uh, uh, some of the bugs worked out of the system. But, you know, you have the the struggles of, of pre-employment inside of an institution and getting all that lined up at the same time trying to deal with the struggles of, of the civil service process. And uh, many of us, I'm sure, on this call have, have um, recognized those struggles at times and figuring out how to uh, get that accomplished. But just here recently, we had this last fall, we had over at Solano State Prison, um, we partnered with uh, many people with uh, CDCR, DRP, education, uh, the institution, Cal PIA, uh, Caltrans, um, Joe and Travis at their workforce development uh, was right there with us along the way. <clears throat> and we actually uh, came together of setting up a process over there of recognizing about, I think we started with about 60 incarcerated individuals that uh, met some qualifications that we thought that would uh, meet the Caltrans uh, 
requirements of coming into um, those particular positions and if they were interested or not. And we surveyed them and tried to get them to be uh, interested in that and, and got it worked down to a little bit over 30 individuals uh, that were going to uh, be involved in that process. Uh, we had some um, added features this time. We had a town hall meeting where we educated them about civil service, about the job, about what the process is going to be, um, about how to apply for the position, applied them sample applications. Um, and then the education uh, team there at the institution took over and actually then provided them an hour's worth of education on how to, guess what, run a computer because half of them didn't even know what this, you know, what this little mouse thing was on their screen. Lost my video. Everyone still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, okay. We, um, yeah, when we turn on as panelists, if we turn it off, we can't turn it back on. Uh, the, the, okay. So if, uh, as long if as you Ross, can hear me. Yeah. So for us, if you can uh, help us turn back on our videos, it's the same thing we're happening over here. That's all right. Um, I think I have a face for radio, anyway. So that's good. Anyways, uh, what we did is then we had that uh, town hall meeting, which I think was an added feature from the previous two that added a little bit more uh, pizzazz and interest to our program. But that educational piece of, 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 of them understanding what a mouse does on a screen and be able to click on it. Um, and then obviously we had to take all those individuals at a later time, come back and put them through the actual state exam process, meaning we had to work through gate clearances and have custody lined up to escort them in and out of computer areas. We had to have, you know, chaperones in there, uh, you know, watching them take and, and explore the actual process and helping them do the, the testing. And it was really quite a uh, event to have that many people join together to get them to do that. But at the end, of those individuals qualified on a Caltrans exam, I think except for one or two possibly that didn't pass one of the exams, actually qualify um, to be on that list for a civil service exam in Caltrans um, to actually be qualified for an interview. So I think that was a huge feat to get, you know, 29 out of 30 of those qualified on at least one application through that entire process. Um, then, of course, we had to come back with the, with the same team again uh, several weeks later process, all the stuff that's going on at institution, we still overcame uh, that and were able to show up at the institution with the warden's help and conduct interview panels for all of those individuals that were qualified for that job. And, um, and that was, uh, took us one day to do that. And uh, I believe at the end of the day, um, all of them, about four individuals were actually given a letter of intent uh, um, to come and, and, and attend a Caltrans job once they're released. They actually got a letter, had a name and phone number, had an email address um, and said, congratulations, um, once you get out, please contact this number. Uh, you've met the requirements and we're interested in hiring you. And so uh, in a nutshell, that was a huge success in regards to actually being able to leave those incarcerated folks inside that wall, a chance or a hope with that letter that they were going to actually be able to get out and make a phone call. Um, I'm very happy to say at this point, uh, since we've held that event, we've had four individuals release and we had four individuals make that phone call and we now have four individuals in the hiring process with Caltrans. So it is working. Um, there's a lot of other small individual details, you know, I didn't cover. And if any of you have any more questions about it, I'd be happy to, to answer, or answer or even some of the individuals on the call were participants in that can maybe fill those calls. But um, that uh, partnership, that uh, pre-entry civil service um, uh, process, it did work. It took a lot of joint combined effort, a lot of hard work, even through COVID and a lot of joint relationships. And I, I can't say nothing but positive things about it. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rusty. Yeah. Um, just, you know, from from those on the outside, we might not think about all the logistics that had to go into our, uh, you know, in-prison civil service hiring events, but even just, you know, operating computers is one of the one of the first steps to, to doing it. Um, and so it was a really great learning experience from our perspective at CWDB, and we're just so happy that that we're we're working through this together and learning together and, you know, just building those partnerships to go forward. 
All right, and uh, thanks, Rusty. And, and so Ryan, uh, with, with DAPA, with the Division of uh, Adult Parole Operations, uh, if you could please uh, start off by, by uh, uh, telling us a little bit about the referral system that's been built into Pivots, the case management system used by parole officers, and just a little bit about the efforts uh, that, that have been undertaken to try to you know, really, really build this marriage, as we say, between, our, between the workforce system and the correction system. Yeah, thank you, Travis and and uh, Joe and your teams at uh, Workforce Development Board. We appreciate it. And I want to say I do miss the uh, in-person summits where, you know, at least we get the free lunch. But um, no, and I miss seeing you guys, too, in person. This COVID is, is I think, driving a lot of us crazy. Um, I wanted to just, before I shared about the referral, just begin with a story that I've shared with a number of you. And I think I spoke it at one of the summits we had. Back in 2009, um, I was a parole agent. And I had someone on my caseload who asked my help in getting a job. And I was a newer agent, and so I didn't really know a lot of places, but I knew about the Employment Development Department. And I, I drove this, this, this gentleman who was on parole to the front desk of the EDD. I went inside with him. We signed in, and we waited for a bit before a representative came and talked to us, very kind and very gracious, but quickly realized that this person had felonies and promptly encouraged the the man to go to a local day, day labor office. Um, there wasn't much they could do to help him because of his criminal record. I remember he was, you know, a bit dejected, um, but he was determined and he went over and got a job. And over time, he was able to slowly get his life back together. And so saying that, we want to fast forward to 2019 when, when myself and an, a, a number of us began working in these corrections workforce meetings with all the other agencies involved in uh, prison to employment. I remember thinking, this is pretty exciting, that the first time I've seen in my history uh, working in the corrections that people wanted to give jobs to those on parole supervision or out in formerly justice and incarcerated. And so uh, I remember being excited and, and thinking, hey, what could this look like with employment assistance and potential jobs and careers? But I, again, I was remembering the history and I was thinking, hey, well, this is probably too good to be true because you know a lot of our programs that across the state often I have bureaucracy and red tape and only to find when we apply for with our for parolees that uh, they ran out of funding or they didn't meet the criteria for some reason. So I was a little skeptical, but I just remember thinking as we as we began working together, I just remember the enthusiasm of everybody involved in the, in the process, um, you know, and our team together with, a, with everybody on this call probably had a part in this at some point. Um, whether it was state parole, the California Workforce Development Board, the local workforce development boards, the AJCCs. Um, we really worked together to develop a process to where um, our state parole agents could refer those on parole supervision to their local AJCC nearest their house. I remember we, we started this, these pilots with, a, with Celico and Seta, who I, I just want to throw a shout out to because they were amazing and worked so hard in getting the pilots going and, and running. And then we were able to, to roll them out statewide, which as was spoken to earlier, this program has led to jobs for formerly incarcerated. It's led to training and the ability for our agents to refer any parolee to any uh, Amer American Job Center in California is, is, is unprecedented. And <clears throat> you know, we've, we've worked together with some of the local workforce across the state. Our Division of Adult Programs unit teams have invited the workforce to our community meet team meetings we call them our PAC meetings, and we have several reentry resource centers in, in Los Angeles and Alameda and Stockton that um, workforce has worked with us together to get folks jobs and get them training. And again, I just want to appreciate the enthusiasm of everybody that has been helping. Um, this truly has been a, a, a juggernaut of an endeavor, but um, there was a lot of hard work in, in administering this system over the past few years. So thank you to uh, my team, who are on the call today, Adult Programs Unit from DAPO, you guys continue to shine in the as the face of reentry on our side and helping uh, partners with our, our agencies, helping the parole agents ensure that they're aware of this information. And then the AJCC staff who are on the ground working with our team, working with those on parole. You guys are the ones out there changing lives and helping. And so we, we really value you. And just, you know, we get, we get locked up in Sacramento sometimes. We don't get out of our holes much, but um, we want to value, we, we want to thank you and we value your partnership ongoing. Um, this is not just a one-time deal. This is 
we're in this together for the long haul. And, and I just wanted to close. There's a number of success stories that, that, that we've all heard. I just wanted to share one that was shared with me recently. I'm just going to read this. Um, it was about Monica. She was a 20, 20 year old female and mother of two. She had been in and out of prison for six years um, and she had a lot of barriers to employment. She completed the MC3 training program with prison to employment funding and received her MC3 certificate. And once her training was completed, she was able to join one of the local labor unions. She quickly got a job and was working construction, um, but she had children. And thankfully her employer uh, allowed her to work an alternative schedule to help her with her daycare situation. And at the time she was living in the Salvation Army program in transitional housing with her children. But after a few months, she was able to save enough and get permanent housing. And over time, she was able to even promote and get a, get a career in another field. But I just wanna say all that was possible because of this program and because of the staff that are working with these folks out in the community. And so this is just one example, three lives, mother and two daughters that were changed significantly because of what you and your teams do. And so I just wanted to thank everybody again and uh, we look forward to your future partnership in this. Thank you. Thanks so much to our panel. Um, if we could go ahead and, and share screen the idea boards and take a look at, at questions uh, that have come in. Um, I think, I know we have at least one. It's just kind of a reminder of everyone how to, how to submit questions for our panelists today. Perfect, so, so there's a screenshot of the idea board starting in the upper left and we'll just be going from the upper left to, towards the bottom right as the day goes along. Um, all right, um, so, so I know we have one question. I think it's a really great question. Um, and for anyone who, who wants to answer, I don't know, maybe Joseph or, or Ryan or Rusty, uh, what are ways to support people while they are incarcerated that allows for a smoother transition into the workforce once, once they are released? Uh, Rusty, you want to go? You want me to take it? Ryan, you ready to go, buddy? Well, I was just going to say, from 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 parole perspective, we do we do have some staff that assist um, prior to release and they're you know preparing with the individuals, um, reentry planning and such. And um, just one suggestion I have: I used to work in that in that in that area. Um, family and advocacy support with these individuals is very key and vital to the success of those when they come out of uh, institutions. So. If there's, if there's ways you're able to in person um, visit and assist that individual, uh, providing them you know, programs or support mechanisms, um, giving them ideas and or you know, basically helping them prepare so that when they come to uh, about six months prior to release, they'll meet with our staff, they have kind of an idea of the plan and they can bring that plan to, to, our, to our staff and we will help them on the, we also have resources and such for those individuals when they when they meet about six months out. But this doesn't really do a lot for the long term for those who are there for a while. And maybe um, Rusty or, um, can speak to that, or <clears throat> excuse me, or Joe. <clears throat> pardon me. But anyway, we there are there are. I really think that family support and program advocacy groups can really help in that aspect. And I'll turn it turn it back to you, Joe. Appreciate that, uh, Rusty. Did you have something you want to add before I offer something? Um, so, uh, with regard to the first question, um, uh, what are ways to support people while they're incarcerated? I think that uh, Ryan uh, hits it on the head. Um, it, it, it really depends on the advocacy position you have that um, uh, it, it, from which you want to help, right? So, are you a local neighbor to an institution and you just want to do something that is good for individuals and good for the, um, for the state? That's one advocacy. Are you an AJCC leader? That's another. If, if you are a nonprofit and uh, you want to work on uh, helping the unhoused, and you know that some of these people that are going to be coming out of institutions will be, in fact, unhoused. Uh, so I, um, I, I put my um, email earlier in the chat. Uh, if you are not knowing how you can help from your role of advocacy, I'm happy to help connect you with um, in the people inside CDCR uh, that would be appropriate to your role. Um, I think that uh, uh, you're gonna find a very exciting uh, program coming up if you're in AJCC 
um, from the Motherload uh, Job Training Center uh, presentation that's going to be following this, uh, which uh, CTE is very uh, heavily invested in because we believe in the leadership that uh, Motherload is taking in um, this um, support while incarcerated and transition to successful support post incarceration. So I'm not going to um, get it. I'm not going to step on their presentation. Uh, but I think you'll find it as exciting as we do. And so since we're talking mostly to people within workforce development, uh, I really believe that is the future of both our organizations. I think CDCR needs to be on board and co-invested as a partner. And I believe uh, all of our AJCCs uh, do as well, because that also incorporates DAPO, that also incorporates Cal PIA, and basically it's all oars in the water in the same boat instead of having people um, rowing in different boats. Um, so I hope that's not too ambiguous um, and I'm happy to answer a follow-up question if I miss the point. No, I think that was great, Joseph. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, and so I think we have one more question before we uh, move on to our next panel. I think this is a, a question really for Ryan um, about your thoughts on, on sort of the, what should be done before folks might get referred. I guess it's kind of a question about how do we best um, analyze uh, whether someone is a, a good candidate for referral to workforce services, uh, you know, whether we focus on, on basic skills, soft skills, job skills, or, or whatever it might be. What do you think, Ryan? You know, I think it's important that there's ongoing communication between the local um, AJCC and the local parole agent that might be supervising or working with that individual. I think that's going to be paramount into that discussion on preparing and needs. And, you know, thankfully, our partners with the Division of Rehabilitative Programs do contract across the state for, for those on parole supervision. So they're able to, if they need skills, if they need training, if they need um, clothes, we have what we call our day reporting centers that, that are out in the communities in larger metropolitan areas to help individuals um, get on their feet, get stable in the community, get the, the resources they need. Um, and then secondly, we have other, other, uh, other programs that we, that we partner with, our adult programs, you know, partners with um, other agencies as well that such as Goodwill and a lot of CBOs, community-based organizations out there, um, Amity, um, there's, there's a whole, whole, whole bunch across the state. And, and really the goal is to help them get everything they need to be successful. And so those efforts do happen. Um, I do, we do, you know, early on we were, we were in these conversations and developing this. Well, our goal is to not necessarily refer somebody to the workforce boards and the uh, AJCCs that's definitely not ready to be working. And so if that's happening, those conversations at the local level can be had. Um, of course, if you run into barriers, uh, myself and my team were available to help as well, but really that that local connection is important. And if you need to know, if you're not sure who those people are, um, again, you can reach out to us through through the through this through this venue, and we can we can connect you. So, hopefully, I got that. Yeah, I think so, Ryan. This is Joe. Uh, I know we're we're trying to we're trying to get back on camera, so the our admin team's helping us out in the background. But and uh, Rusty has texted me since uh, he's been caught with the internet gremlins, where his Zoom wasn't working properly uh, after his his piece. Uh, so he's he I know he's trying to listen in via phone, but uh, I think we're just having a little bit of Zoom uh, technical difficulties. Uh, globally. So uh, he, he's apologizing for that. So I just want to acknowledge that he just didn't magically leave um, uh, his computer. It, it's, it's a combination of everything, right? So uh, gentlemen, thank you very much. We're going to end this panel. Um, uh, to the folks that are listening to us, our attendees, please continue to uh, send comments to the idea boards. We will send these messages out to Joseph, Ryan, Rusty. Um, I, Joseph, I think you were sending out your contact email. Uh, we will gather those, uh, those thoughts on the idea boards. It will export out to a PDF. We'll put it onto our P2E summit page for uh, attendees that will be joining us later. Uh, but if there's any, uh, any final thoughts, we appreciate your uh, collaboration. I know uh, working at the statewide level, uh, making sure our systems are not siloed, they are aligning. How can we have these conversations together? Uh, and then we see, we have seen the fruits of our efforts. Uh, Ryan, like how you said, you were there at that first summit in Anaheim in 2019, May, 
and here we are uh, in a digital summit, Zoom, a Zoom summit, uh, and here we are now. What we were trying to do back then, look where we're at today, and what we're continuing to do in the uh, future years to come. So I appreciate uh, DAPO's efforts. Joseph, I appreciate your efforts. And Rusty, uh, I know we would love to do more civil service hiring events across the California. We have some things um, pre-planning already in progress. And so stay tuned for uh, future updates. But gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, for your time and effort. So if I, if you turn off your camera, I don't think you can turn it back on, uh, but please stay with us if you, uh, if you have the time. Um, uh, I think the audio still works. So maybe if there's some Q and A later on uh, if um, to help us out. So with that, we'll take a pause for a moment. Uh, if the admin team can help put the title card to our next panel, I think we're pretty good on time. We're gonna go to our next panel call uh, pivoting in response to COVID. Um, and so let's, yeah, well, I think we're right on time in our, our agenda. So let me try to bring up now. Uh, thank you, Christian. Thank you, Alfredo, for joining us in, um, this next panel. Now that, uh, we have set the table with our corrections workforce partnership at the statewide level. We now did our P2E grant to the field across the state of California. And then guess what? March 2020 happened, right? And so as we were all preparing to serve our folks in our region, and then the world literally changed. So my first question to you, Kristen, can you start off uh, kind of describing, um, you know, in your southern border region, what was your original plan? and how COVID affected your original plan, and then how did you then respond and pivoted in, in COVID? Absolutely, thanks, Joe. Um, so our original plan was based on our nationally recognized model for having job centers in jails. Um, we have two full-fledged full uh, service career centers existing in our jails pre-pandemic. Um, and we really used um, that model to link to post-release services. So it's the same person that the individuals were working with pre-release, the same case managers that they were assigned to, they would also work post-release. And we have a lot of statistical analysis that that works really well in keeping, uh, keeping uh, participants engaged and more likelihood of, of being placed in a job and keeping that job and lower recidivism rates. Unfortunately, uh, you know, like you said, March uh, 2020 happened and we no longer had access to our jails and we still don't have access to our jails. Um, so we are looking forward to a, a day on the horizon when we can resume those services. Um, but we really had to focus all of our efforts on uh, post-release and connecting with individuals post-release. Um, and how do you do that when you don't have that pipeline um, of participants flowing straight from from incarceration, uh, we really focused on partnerships. Um, partnerships were key to getting a pipeline and a momentum for um, seeing where the need was for being connected with participants. We were having a lot of conversations in those early months. My calendar was just jam-packed with talking to everyone and anyone who heard about prison to employment, who had people that perhaps needed services. And we really saw that the number of conversation really deeply correlated with the number of opportunities that were coming our way. And we were a lot more flexible as an intermediary. We were a lot more boots on the ground. We were recruiting participants ourselves. We were, you know, getting a Facebook message from someone that we have um, a, a colleague relationship with about a participant that was in need. And we were trying to connect that participant with our service provider. Um, we also had some instances in early on where we had some people that were staying um, at a hotels and using vouchers there and they needed to get connected to our services. So we met in a, co a courtyard outside, we had masks on, but we did provide in-person services even in the early days. Um, and we did all the other stuff that I, I know everyone else on the call did as well. You know, all, of, all the services went online. We provided a laptop upon that first interaction with participants to keep them engaged and a cell phone. Um, and we did um, flex our services to meet in some of the participants' homes, which I don't think we had ever done before. Um, and we did that as safely as possible, you know, masked up and, and go, go in pairs. Um, but those were some of the strategies and the pivots that we took on took early on in the pandemic to make sure that we could still provide 
services and still get connected with. We know there are people in need. We know that there are people that are desperate for our services, but they just don't have the information that we exist. Thank you, Kristen. And I know we've had previous conversations late last year, and you introduced us to uh, a fantastic testimonial that we wanted to make sure we have on for this summit. So we're going to have her a little bit later on. So thank you for connecting us to her to further uh, to further emphasize how pivoting during COVID actually happened from the participants' point of view. So thank you for helping us out with that. Uh, Alfredo, same question to you. Uh, I know you're in charge. Uh, you're the lead in a very big region. Um, and then, yeah, March 2020, March 2020 happened, right? So how, what did you, how did your folks uh, respond into COVID uh, to provide services for our folks in the Central Valley? Joe, I, I think uh, one of the things I was looking at the agenda right before COVID and uh, and it's um, uh, the topics I had on here um, that for our region to talk about was the MOU with DMV with Donita Landucci. So we were getting ready to to launch the, the Cal ID program between DMV and introduce that to other areas that Kern County already had going for us. So we had a, a, a little step right there ahead of the game. And then uh, the other things that we were doing is uh, getting ready with the warden letter, um, our visits, uh, Bill Muniz from the CDCR, Rafael Aguilera and Sydney, they helped us really get a schedule going um, and this, this all happened right before that we, we got lucky because we were able to get in there and talk to them. But these are the things that we were planning to do. We had a Cal PIA meeting face to face with Kevin Cole and, uh, and, and Randy Fisher. Um, so, you know, we, and this is with the group. This is with the entire region. Our region stretches from Kern to San Joaquin County, 144,000 square miles, 13 facilities is who we were looking at being able to serve. And, and the one thing that I think think did help tremendously is we were able to get into those 13 facilities. All the hard work definitely paid off on the scheduling that it was an aggressive schedule to get in there and talk to them. And, and we met in all the different locations. We invited the wardens, the assistant wardens, and then the uh, the and all the facilities that were together. Um, so we were able to, to um, and all the local workforce development boards of that area to make those connections with them. I think that that was really key that got a lot of momentum going and helped us um, ask ask the critical questions I think um, we were well received in those 13 facilities and and some of the wardens were really asking what else can we do on the inside our focus was pre-release our, our focus we, we really when we wrote this grant we were focusing on on, on the pre-release part of it uh, as uh, as as one of the biggest components, and then the handoff and the re-entry. So we were able to to get that introduced, and we were able to get that going in some areas. They were able to talk to some of the wardens that uh, that they've been wanting to connect with, um, and then work with the CBOs. So work with the CBOs. Um, the adjustment, I think it's one of the biggest things, Joe. We um, lost a lot of CBOs. They closed their doors. You know, they they were not open. Uh, and so then we had to then scramble and, and find how we're going to provide the services, who did stay open and, and to what degree. You know, um, we were meeting a lot of individuals by appointment only. But one of the things that really helped us was Career Hub is what we use as a texting tool. And, and it's one of those things that really was a lifesaver, especially with this population. It, it just helps us to text and get going. I think we were already on our way to online, many of us, and COVID just pushed us uh, aggressively to go online. So whatever plans we had, we, we really sped them up. And in a way, really, um, we created the orientation on video. We created the packets online. We, it, just, it just really, it, it, it was, it was um, in, in some respects, what we needed to get going um, to, to be able to help a lot of individuals electronically. And then when we need to have that signature, when we needed any, any of the important paperwork, have that one meeting, but everything else was held electronically. As, as Kristen mentioned, I think a lot of us adjusted the same way. Great, Alfredo. Thank you for your comments on that. Uh, Travis, you have a question? Yeah, I, I, a question that just came up uh, to me is to kind of ask a little bit more about how you guys went about deciding whether it was time to abandon some of your pre-COVID plans 
and kind of how you weighed, how you analyzed the landscape about what might be open, what might be closed and kind of say, you know what, I don't think we're going to get jail access. So it's time to move on to a different strategy. Uh, kind of, how, how did you go about, you know, analyzing just the, the landscape of the ever changing restrictions and rules and thinking about maybe some best practices, you know, going forward, given COVID? Kristen, you want to go first? Yeah, great question. Um, I think in the beginning, it was this acceptance that we are learning in real time. And I don't have all the answers. And I don't have this way to forecast a perfect program design. Um, and so learning to accept that and learning to uh, be open to learning every day of what, what we were learning, what we were hearing, what we were seeing, what worked, what didn't work, what we felt good about, just being really open to that process was, was key, especially early on. Um, we have kept the conversation going with sheriffs throughout the past two years of whether we could get in uh, back in the jails or not. Um, so, you know, we, we're, that was always in the back of our heads, at it, hoping that that would come through eventually. We did have one cohort that ran virtually through, through our jails and, um, because even just gathering people in one room to watch a computer screen, it, it could create some safety, safety, safety concerns. So, um, so we really saw that that was going to be really difficult to, 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 to master that program design that we had, um, we had forecasted and we had to let go of that. And we had to go in another direction, which was really through the partnerships and all of those touch points and, and regular communication that I was talking about before um, and just really focusing on the, the post-release. And that was really what we were hearing even when we had conversations with sheriffs. They're like, we have reduced our, our jail population so much by 50%. Our, our local jails here in San Diego County reduced their population by 50%. Um, the people are in the community. That's where we need to go out and get them. They're, they're serving time. They're not going to be placed in jail for unless they have really severe, um, severe uh, things that they are being convicted of or in the process of being convicted of. They're going to be on probation. So we focused on the community and we really um, reached out to people. And, and, you know, it goes back to like the basics of workforce development. The, the real relationships, real relationships ba based on trust, that is what drives change, is real relationships based on trust. We did some research with the first round of P2E funds, and that came out really strong in the research, that if you, especially with Justice Involved, if you want to see outcomes, if you want to see behavioral changes, you have to have relationships based on trust. So we went back to the basics of workforce development, and rallied the team and had weekly check-ins and just talked about that, talked about really caring about each other, caring about what each other's going through, acknowledging the trauma, acknowledging the fear, acknowledging that we don't know what we're going to do next, but we are in it together. Um, I think that really created a bond and like a drive and a fire in all of us to really rise to the occasion of the moment um and see what we could do and share the success stories oh my gosh we sh we, we we celebrated the small wins in the beginning so much just to keep the optimi optimism and the positivity alive and well um because we were doing things that were different we were doing things that were different the things that we weren't used to doing things that we were uncomfortable doing and we were in it to win it and we wanted to have that type of mentality um and i think it, it really worked and and for our benefit you know we hired um a team that is still in place, even though all of the turnover um, that we've experienced in other areas of our organization, the, the P2E team has stayed intact. Um, and the participants, the participants were engaged and they were they were showing up and they were calling and they were needing our, our relationship, that real relationship. And that relationship had to be judgment-free. Um, you know, we really approached these individuals with um, not what did you do? Um, it was what has happened to you? What trauma have you gone through? What horrible abuse have you been inflicted upon in your life? And how can we really wrap our arms of love around you? Yes, we, we support the workforce function, but we also are believers in real relationships and that's what drives people to change and believe in themselves. Um, and then lastly, I just wanna talk about the supportive services that that was so key in keeping people engaged and keep, keeping people encouraged and keeping them coming and then talking to us, uh, keeping the conversation going. You know, if, if, 
if, if anybody's experienced on this call, I'm sure there's very few of us that have made fast money that have made, you know, a thousand dollars in a day. And you have to go back to waiting, you know, two weeks to get a paycheck and you aren't be able to cover your bills and everything's more expensive now. You need some wins. You need some monetary wins. And the supportive services really allowed us to do that and keep people encouraged that I know it's slow. I know it's a different pace of bringing in income, but we're going to get you there. Thank you, Christian. Alfredo, same question to you. Yeah, the, I, I think uh, we were relying um, monthly meetings. We we held them religiously throughout the entire uh the, as a matter of fact, the last one is 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 uh is actually next month. Um, but the first Thursday of the month at 1:30, we had an opportunity to share what are we doing. So there's eight local workforce development boards in our area, and and we would hear things like Tulare County. They they had a um, virtual. It it, it was a drive-through job fair. And it was held outside, you know, so those those types of of, uh, of uh, examples is what we were sharing with others, you know, and 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 that's that's where they, you know, you get that support and then also having the virtual the virtual reentry job fairs, um, you know, because you're able to address the soft skills and the job readiness at the same time. I think that that helped uh, tremendously being able to share what we were doing. But we we did abandon we did abandon some projects merced had a construction trades uh project that 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 they were going to to uh to be able to hold and and we had to say you know that's not going to happen you know we're not meeting in person so we had to adjust um and those services and we had to modify the agreement with them however our our bigger our bigger um goals we we kept going we kept chipping at the cal id uh you know working with cal pia i remember getting a call and and saying hey we have two individuals that are going to be released in your area and then i would give them the contact person for that local area one of them came through as a they needed someone from i think an area in la and i was able to connect that that individual over to them but you know we also focus on having a landing web page we were able to do that we focus on having a little booklet and we shared that with everyone, something that's that's really uh, at a at an elementary level, what to do, something that they it's a it's a it's a booklet they can keep with them. They can put all the important information so that when they apply, they have with them. We were able to share those things with the rest of the of the of the areas. And as I mentioned, those those warden meetings we still held and we're still holding strong on trying to get I, I know that Director Schultz on here and Tim Rainey's on here. We've met with them on on uh, trying to get, and with you as well, you were on that meeting with the Social Security Administration, getting that MOU going because a lot of work was done by Kern County. And, and this is being held, uh, done already in other states where an individual being released that doesn't have a Social Security card that is eligible for one can get one upon their release. You know, I think that this is a, a it's something that we need to do in California. We're going to keep pushing it. Michael Saltz already laid the, the the groundwork from Kern County on this, you know, and we have been providing this information. And it the talks are already happening. Director Schultz already in communication with the Social Security Administration. So now it's just a matter of time. And and I think it's going to be a, a really great thing. So we abandoned some. We really um you just really doubled down on, on the other ones to try to make those things happen. So it, but it was an adjustment. One of the things that helped us get there is I did monitor all the areas and we asked the critical question, hey, what what's going on? What are you doing? How are you adjusting? And then if you need a budget modification, you know, we need to push those through and we were able to do that. The one thing that I think helped us tremendously, and I'm going to bring this up also in the next session, is is how responsive the state board was. We kept Angela Mendibles and James Hill. We'd ask questions. It seemed like it was like every week, every other week. Can we do this? Can we do that? Can we do that? And and ninety nine percent of the time, it's it was a yes, which was just fantastic for them to. And they were very responsive. And we were asking, you know, what? How can we help? Kristen brought up the supportive services. Those are the things that we wanted to really promote and and be able to get going. And it, like I said, it was it. It seems like it was a a lot of flexibility with this funding. Joe is what really helped us um, exceed our enrollments. Our expenditures are not, you know, are not super high. But like I said, we we um, we did the best we can, and we modified as we went through to make sure that we maximize the expenditures throughout our entire region. 
Great, Alfredo, and you're kind of leading me to my next question as we're wrapping up this panel. Um, yes. of, and I'll go to Christian first. Um, because we all collectively had to pivot and and try new techniques that never have, have we done before. What some uh, best practices that you think you're implementing now that we're just never going to go back to? Now that we are in a changed world, what are some of the new things that we have learned collectively that we will implement in uh, in 22, 23, 24? Um, I think the frequency of communication at all levels. So, Alfred, thanks for taking my point about how how flexible and available California Workforce Board has been. Um, lots of communication, lots of jumping on calls. Let's figure this out together. Like that, that kind of attitude and spirit. I, I think I hope that's that stays intact. And also at, here at uh, San Diego Workforce Partnership, we pivoted. You know, we. We're usually more focused on compliance and performance monitoring, and we were more concerned about the day-to-day -day operations and more involved in the day-to-day -day operations and involved in going to the events that were being hosted and connecting participants and organizations and our subcontractors together. We were very much in the details and in the weeds of the work, and that's here to stay. Um, as well as, as working with the team that provides the direct services and, and creating real relationships with them. And, um, you know, leadership at all levels has really stood out to me during the past two years, having strong leadership, championing strong leadership. Um, and, you know, I think we are all hungry for that during this time to have people really um, stand up and say what they are thinking and what they are feeling and, um, we just saw that leadership at all levels, at the case management level, at the at the subcontractor level. We saw strong leadership skills, um, which are just so um, essential um, and 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 really really needed. Um, people to speak out and people to say, "Hey, I think we we should do this," and and just being brave and being courageous to to be in the arena with us and. And there wasn't a thought, you know, that wasn't too big. You know, we wanted to think bigger in this moment. Um, other things that I hope stay with us is I hope um, the flexibility with the supportive services, I hope we've learned that that's a tool to engage and, and to um, support um, getting to the, the job part. Um, and I think we also want to um, work with our justice involved um, brothers and sisters for a longer period of time. I think, uh, you know, P2E might be the first step in healing and getting the A job, but it's not always going to be the career type jobs. But with continued work, we can get there. Um, so I think that's another change that we're making, looking at this being a really long term relationship and perhaps multiple programs that will serve the individuals to get to that point of the career pathways, sustaining wages, family sustaining wages, permanent houses, all housing, all of those things. The first couple of years are really about stabilization and uh, basic needs and healing. And then we get to some real, some real good stuff, which is um, you know, the career, the career sustaining pathways. Christian Alfredo. Yes, I I, I want to uh, highlight. Um, one of the big, um, one of the uh, one of the largest areas is Tulare County, and Tulare County has a multidisciplinary team, um, and it's and it's team led. And what's really neat is that the results of P two E, um, Lisa Martinez down there is was one of the coordinators. Um, she shares the results of of. Uh, of P2E with all of the teams that come together that have to do with justice involved. So this is one of the things, one of the key takeaways is sharing our success and our struggles with the other areas to see how they can help out, you know, because they had a, a probation, parole, adult ed, they had, um, you know, the uh, guest presenters like EDD and, and you know, when they were talking about WOTC and ED, so everything is coming together but they, they also had their own team vision, which is a peer-to-peer -peer network to share best practices, resources, outcomes, challenges, and support one another with the focus on serving the reentry. 
population and supporting their goals. I think one of the big takeaways is doing that, is, is including them in these meetings, including them in what we're doing. And this is, this. I, I think it was it's that aha moment, you know, that that you see how it's working well in one area. And this is one of the key the key things that I wanted to share with with at this summit is that is that you have to be purposeful and strategic and bring everyone in. I, I know that we had the e referral system, and it was you know we, it was lacking in many places. Like what's going on? What's going on? Why aren't we getting these referrals through CDCR's e referral system? And and we it got to the point that uh, Stephen Wheeler jumped on and he helped us find out where those bottlenecks were. And, and how the emails were going to someone that wasn't even there. So then they requested and we provided this uh, generic email, um, email address that it gets sent to along with other key individuals. It's, it's them also um, changing how they do business. And, and that one thing really, really opened up um, a lot of referrals um, to places like Stanislaus County, you know, to play, you know, with, with us, I did see as we were starting the, the, starting this conversation um the entire summit there was a picture of dapo and us together you know that I, I hope that that one comes up at the next session because that's what it's about and then when you're able to come together with all those other areas with all those other organizations that are still here because we did have some close their doors and and but the ones that are still here and knowing that uh, they also work regionally i think that helps that that little spillover to the other counties helps i met individuals that during some of those meetings that were working down south in in Baker in the Bakersfield area, so it was kind. Of, it, it was really neat that how they come together and they're also listening to us, even though we're very territorial. Um, they're able to uh, go across the different territories. I think that's a huge takeaway from what we're doing, and I can't stress enough how much having a texting tool that your staff can use from their desktop. Uh, you know how how valuable it is because everyone re responds really to text and calls not as much. And, and so that really helped us moving forward, Joe. Thank you, Alfredo. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, right now I'm checking the idea boards on my second screen. There's no questions uh, from the field because I think we all have collectively lived this life. And, yes. um, uh, but no, some of the questions we had for you all today, uh, you know, some of this, what can be sustainable going forward? You all just spoke to that very perfectly. Alfredo, I know you're going to be in our next panel uh, talking about re regional partnerships. So uh, thank you for that. Kristen, um, thank you again for your help. Uh, thanks for your calls and introducing us to Miss Wendy. I know she's going to be a rock star later on in the day. Yes. <laughs> um, so with that, we're going to go into a break for us to catch our collective breaths because of the tech issues. Uh, and plus, I need I know I need a bio break. So we're going to go to uh, a quick break. We're going to come back. Uh, what time did we say, Travis? What time are we going to come? About 1035. In the meantime, uh, our admin team is going to put a, a title card saying that we are on break. We're going to also do a poll number three to start off our next panel. So with that, Christian, uh, Kristen, excuse me, Alfredo, thank you very much for joining us and speaking to your experiences uh, from your perspective uh, about responding in COVID. I know we all live that collectively, but to hear it, how everyone had to just be creative um, and how can we all learn from each other? And you guys spoke to it but so so very well. So with that, we are going to take a quick break. We're going to go off mic, off camera, and uh, we'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you. All right. So with that, our next uh, panel is about regional partnerships. Uh, the, the Prison to Employment Initiative uh, is, is part of a big push that we've made in recent years uh, in the workforce system in California um, to, to try to focus on, on and try to tailor our policies at the regional level uh, and, and, and where, where regions can, can best work together to, to coordinate around their unique needs and unique economies uh, and unique populations um, um, to, to try to best be successful. So, so with us on our panel today, um, Alfredo Mendoza uh, from San Joaquin County is back. I think I'll let everybody introduce themselves uh, just to make sure we get your titles correct. We also have uh, Dave Tony, Dave Tooney in German, uh, from, from the Mighty Mother Load, along with Amy Frost. Um, so um, Alfredo, if you could just reintroduce yourself with your full title, please. Absolutely, absolutely. Alfredo Mendoza, Administrative Services Manager with San Joaquin County Employment and Economic Development Department. So we're also known as WorkNet here in Stockton and the Stockton area. 
Thanks. And Dave. hi, I'm Dave Taney. Thanks for every possible pronunciation of my name. <laughs> that, that's the safest way to play it. Um, and I'm the executive director in um, at the Motherload Workforce Development Board. We're, um, we're four counties in the central Sierra Nevadas. Uh, think Yosemite National Park and north from there, uh, 5,000 square miles, uh, snow, mountains, trees, and mostly rural population. And hi, I'm Amy Frost, Deputy Director in Motherload. Thanks, Amy. Welcome, guys. I also I forgot to mention an announcement. We wanted to make sure that we clarified all of our all of our attendees today that uh, the chat has been on fire, which is really awesome. We're happy to see everybody uh, sharing their contact information, sharing what they do, uh, getting connected. And so we're definitely going to make sure that that chat um, is exported and onto our website so that we can post the record of the chat um, in case you miss anything, you know, want to scroll back up that we'll have that on the website for, for information there. I um, also want to be sure to remind everyone once again about our idea boards that we will be using to submit questions uh, to our panelists. I think we've already had a, a couple of, of questions get posted for this panel, and so we'll be, be getting to that uh, towards the end. All right, so uh, regional partnerships. I want to kick it off with, with uh, Alfredo. Uh, the San Joaquin Valley region is enormous, right? Many, many counties, many local boards, many diverse needs. Uh, how has P2E affected the relationship between all of your region's local boards? Well, I think what has helped us is that this region has been working uh, along with Dave Taney and the mother load together for about 30 years. So I, I think it, if anything, it has strengthened our relationship with the other areas and really provided an opportunity for um, to highlight what's happening in other areas in Kings County, in, in, uh, in Fresno, in Madera, especially. So what, what happens, I think, is that we have an opportunity to share what's happening in a little a county like Madera County, where um, they've already been asked to to set up a mini AJCC in one of the facilities. I, I think that's that's a direct connection with P2E, um, and and as well as as what's happening in the larger areas, as uh, we have visited the facilities in the large areas and and found out what we what they can do pre-release and what we can do pre-release for them because I think that's the key uh, that we didn't get to do as as we move forward is do more pre-release work um, it was something that we wrote into our grant application um, and that's something that we look forward to um, writing in the in the new grant application that that's coming up Thanks, Alfredo. Okay, could you talk a little bit more just about your your region and and all the different boards that are together and kind of what you all do to stay coordinated, and and if P2E has been able to uh, to sort of catalyze that coordination, catalyze everybody working together, or maybe not. Absolutely, it it has been it has been. Uh... Um, what we set out, I think, from the beginning, at the beginning, um, John Solis was the director. Right now, Patty Virgin is, is leading is leading our, our area. And, uh, and one of the things that we set out from the beginning is to have a recurring monthly meeting. I think that that has been key. First Thursday of the month, 1.30 without fail. Uh, and then everyone's able to provide agenda items and things that we, needed to, that we need to discuss and we need to share. And at the same time, it's an opportunity to share with everyone where we are as a group. So San Joaquin County, Stanislaus County, Merced, Madera, Fresno, Tulare, Kings, and then Kern Inyo and Mono, which really is this huge area of the state. Um, we all came together and we were able to, to discuss all of the different items, things that are working, things that are not working, and really um, and formulate sometimes um, we would have questions that we would need the state to be on board. And that's one of the things that really helped us. The state was at every single meeting. I think it's rare. If, if James couldn't make it, Angela would be on. Uh, 
um, but it was always somebody from the state was on. And I think also what helped us is, is our regional advisor would be on the call as well um, when, when, when they were available. So I think that we had that going for us. And then I would report out what we were doing on at, um, at the regional meeting with the directors. So this was a separate meeting. This is just the directors that get together every six weeks um, from the entire region. The next meeting is Friday. And to be able to provide um, the information and what's happening as a region as a whole. So then, then if we needed to make any kinds of changes, um, the directors were always on board with what was happening and what we needed to do. Um, Thanks so much, Alfredo. No, that, that, that's great. And, um, you know, we are always in awe of, of San Joaquin Valley's ability to all work together, despite having so many boards and so many counties and, and just so much physical area, really, so many miles between, between you all. Um, thanks, Alfredo. Uh, Dave. Hey, yes. Amy. Uh, the, the mother load uh, board uh, likes to punch above its weight. We affectionately call it the mighty mother load. And i um, just kind of curious about how you've been able to use P2E um, to strengthen existing partnerships um, um, in, in your area or maybe to bring in new partners uh, in your area. Go ahead. Okay, thanks, Travis. Um, we did prepare a few slides just to talk you through it. Um, and so um, I'll go ahead and kick things off. Go ahead, uh, next slide. So just as a point of context, our our uh, grant um, application was based on this concept of a continuum of service. And so, and, and I know we're not alone in our thinking on this, other, other areas do this too, but we're, we really have locked down on sort of serving people pre-release in America's job center in the prison, bringing the job center into the prison, then working with parole and probation to do a hard handoff um, from those people that are being released so they don't sort of fly into the wind. And then um, that parole and probation will do a hard handoff to the, the uh, job center where they're being released. And it's invariably not the same local area. Uh, we have two prisons in our, in our area, but, but 90 plus percent of those people being released will be released to other parts of the state. So, so this is our uh, proposal and uh, kind of a three-phase, a hard handoff continuum of service. And so we're going to show you uh, partnerships that we've developed at each of those three phases. Um, and, and by the way, the state pilot, we have two state pilots that we're doing. One is to create videos of, of in the prison that we can show in the prison to indoctrinate um, uh, inmates to the AJCC, America's Job Center of California system. And then uh, we also have a pilot to bring Cal jobs into the prison, which is our MIS and uh, system and, and create a version that works in the system. So we've created partnerships at each of those stages. Next slide, please. So uh, on the topic of the state pilots, um, we have, like I said, the, the, um, the, AJCC videos that we've created. I, I wanted to have them ready to show you today, but they're still in production. But there's going to be two 90 second videos that that were produced, uh, that will be produced, and we're working with um, uh, a Hollywood uh, director to to produce those. And then um, P2E Jobs is is Cal Jobs in the prison, and we've done a lot of work with partners on that. Um, and so um, I'll kick things off. Uh, Amy and I are going to tag team this. But uh, if not for this, so the first, the biggest partnership uh, that's enabled our, our help on this is the Workforce Corrections Partnership at the state level. So the State Workforce Board and the, the CDCR um, have gotten together a long time ago when this, when this whole PD, P2E program was launched and, and really put, gave us the air cover to uh, open doors when we needed to get into prisons and talk to you know, various CDCR uh, folks about uh, cooperation uh, that was already made uh, available, that was already enabled at that at that state level. Uh, Amy, do you want to talk about uh, the P2EJobs.com um, program of 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 uh, uh, Cal Jobs in the prison? Sure, absolutely. And um, again, definitely a huge. Um, 
amazing groundwork that was laid by CWDB and CDCR because when we approached the prisons about bringing a data system inside, uh, there was already receptivity to that concept because there was already the mindset that we were all working together for a common goal. So um, bringing p2ejobs.com into the prisons has been quite a, quite a journey. We did um, from the start get tremendous support from Geographic Solutions, the creator of CalJobs. They have been very helpful in designing a safe, um, site according to the specs that um, our partner in CDCR gave us and and so leading into that this none of this could have happened without these entities all working together so um, in the beginning Bill Muniz Bill Muniz who uh, was one of the CDCR champions he did connect us with the EIS Enterprise Information Services, which is the IT within the prisons. And they were very supportive, very welcoming, very open-minded because a lot of the barriers had already um, been broken down in that where there's a wall, we're gonna find a way around it, we have a common goal. So, um, so we did start out working with EIS early on, went to different meetings, heard about um, different projects and goals of information sharing with them. Um, however, we later brought in Department of Rehabilitative Programs and, and that was a key department um, to bring into this project because although in the EIS was very supportive, um, and wanted us to be successful and wanted this um, system available inside, um, it was stuck in a list of priorities and it was stuck at the bottom. <laughs> so bringing DRP in um, and, and having a champion to help us with this, to get it across the goal line, Joseph Piazza has been very instrumental in this piece bringing the DRP team in and giving it a high priority so we could get, a, get it across the goal line in time for grant completion. So we are actually in the final stages of testing. We've gone through multiple iterations. We have um, disabled the maps, um, disabled the links where someone could sneak out any back doors mm -hmm. and made a safe whitelisted version uh, where we're disabling the final LMI la, um, map right now. And then we have uh, DRP and EIS standing by to help us get an approved laptop inside the prison. So all these different pieces will come together at the very final part of our grant, but we will be able to do some something that hasn't been done before, where we have a shared data system pre and post release, um, and, and that will assist us with the hard handoff with our partners. The AJCC videos um, also have been championed by DRP. Uh, we have DRP Media on board, uh, ready to play this throughout the prisons in our local area and possibly throughout the state. Um, and what these AJCC videos will do is they are going to tap into that intrinsic motivation of the viewers so that within the prisons, the people who see these videos will um, subconsciously be motivated to do good things for themselves and for their family. And, and it taps into what motivates them as individuals. So uh, these have been created with the help of information from Scott McClure, a prison psychologist. We have uh, our Hollywood producer who has a home here in the beautiful mother load and also lives in Hollywood. And so we had that uh, wonderful serendipitous connection. And, um, and then DRP is, has been so helpful in and getting us whatever we need, um, being ready to roll these out once the final production is complete. So we did get set back. We, you know, we had planned on doing these things inside the prison well in advance of grants close out, but everybody hit COVID, at, you know, and we all had to push things back and pivot and adapt and, um, and thank God for our champions that have helped us through this process. So, so, 
so that those are our, our pre-release partnerships, especially with the state pilots. And like Amy said, even though we hit COVID, we found creative ways instead of doing live action videos where we couldn't get live actors to to uh, work on sets. We're doing largely animated and live action animation. So we're taking some creative approaches to that. Uh, the next is um, the next slide, please. Is in the middle where we're doing a hard handoff between the pre-release AJCC and the post-release AJCC is handoffs between parole and and then the county. We have four counties in our in our uh, region, and those county um, uh, jails and and sheriff's departments are, are are we have close relationships with them. So I'll let Amy talk about some of the examples of of working with parole and probation. Thank you. So even though we don't. Um we haven't practiced with Cal Jobs actually being in the prison yet. Um, that's to happen within the next couple of weeks. We did do um, the pre-release services. So we would actually go in and do our services and then enter the data once we got outside the prison into Cal Jobs. So we have experienced successful handoffs from pre-release to post-release. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, we had um, our case manager contacted from another local area way down south in California saying, hey, we have your person that you served pre-release and they've come into our AJCC here. So it is working and, and our um, case manager didn't even know that participant had been released um, because things happen very quickly inside the prison, sometimes without warning. So this is a wonderful way to make sure that person doesn't disappear, is that we have them already captured in Cal Jobs. They get released and there's that AJCC waiting on the other side through that hard handoff from parole. We've also had success with probation on the handoffs and are actually um, piloting in our in our region, the working between probation and uh, the AJCC with uh, within CalJobs. So we've created partner accounts with lockdown with view only, and they're able to enter case notes. We have our confidentiality agreements in place, and we actually have a probation officer who is doing pre-release work in the in the jails as well, entering case notes into CalJobs, and um, and then our case managers are able to work side by side. Um, and, and co-case manage that participant. So that's happening with probation right now. We've also had probation and parole actually do drive-bys and drop off their participants directly from jail or prison to our AJCC. We are receiving the DAPO referrals in our emails and, uh, and a lot of partner referrals as well. Uh, we've been in uh, the county day reporting centers have been a good partner in helping us to get the word out to additional um, justice involved individuals, those people who are required and mandated to come into these group meetings. We have a case manager that gives an orientation and an overview and, and connects them with the AJCC and also um, Regionally, we do work in our northern county with Amador, um, with their probation department, and we have a program in place where we leverage funding. So the one AB 109 money that they receive, they've put it towards work experiences so that when individuals are on probation, they connect with us in the AJCC. We have a shared contract. We put them into paid work experiences at public works or work sites that are tailored for that individual's career path. And then we provide that six month work experience. We've had participants be hired on by public works after that. Um, and, and we're looking forward to our private sector or higher ons um, coming up because we believe in it and it'll happen. So, and so, Dave. So I'll just, that wraps up our parole and probation. I'm trying to keep uh, on, on schedule here, but. Um, yeah, I want to uh, be sure that we have time for questions from the idea boards. Uh, yeah. uh, but go ahead, Dave. So one more slide. So uh, we wanted to show you, I mean, we were, we were asked to show examples of partnerships. So here's the last example where, where we have a uh, post-release collaborative of um, that's cre that's teaching pre-apprenticeship training for the construction industry, and it's sponsored by the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission because we have all their water and their power up here at Hetch Hetchy Reservoir. And and so, uh, Amy, why don't you talk about this real briefly? 
Sure, this program um, definitely couldn't be done by any one of these partners alone. And um, the, these MC3 skills are being um, taught. 70% uh, of the participants were justice involved. Um, it did target women and, uh, and it has a high success rate of, uh, of averaging 80 to 90% employment for these different cohorts. So we're in cohort number eight um, with leveraging these funds. And also I do have to give a shout out to the state partnerships, uh, Angela Mendibles, James Hill, uh, Joe Flores, um, Cindy Harrington, you've all been critical players in the success of this program and we couldn't have done it without you um, and, and just your can-do force uh, behind us pushing us forward, so thank you. Okay, that concludes our material to present, so we can uh, take questions now, thanks. Thanks so much, Dave and Amy. Really appreciate that. It's awesome that, that you took the time to put that together. And, and, and by having all those different uh, partners shown, it just really, you know, visually, we have the full screen there, you know, wow. Um, all right, Rod, if we could share the idea boards. Uh, and just a reminder again, that that's how we're doing Q&A for this. And everybody can upvote other questions so we can make sure we, uh, we get to the questions that are uh, uh, most wanted to be looked at. <laughs> Um, I really think that first one there um, about just sort of, just, yeah, just sort of how we um, can address, I don't know, maybe a, 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 like we're talking about a competitive environment between P2E service providers. Um, uh, but, but I guess we just could kind of think about it when, when partnership goes wrong, you know, like how do we balance good competition, which is, you know, trying to provide better stuff versus bad competition, which, which might lead to, you know, uh, negative environments and, and, and not good outcomes for, for people. Um, I don't know, maybe Alfredo, if you could take that first. Yeah, well, one of the things is, is we really lean on um, the areas and, and the flexibility with this funding it, that we wrote into the grant is we're gonna lean on, on what's working in those different areas because what's happening in Tulare, they, they already have something set up that works and they already have their CBOs that they're working for them. And that's, that, that was a little bit that really helped us. We, we in um, San Joaquin County, um, we're looking at, at using some other CBOs. And as you know, the amount of funding when, when we found out it was going to be reduced, it, it had a big impact on that. But overall, I mean, we leaned on what we know how to do is put people to work and put people in training. So we already have those established uh, trainers set up with us. One of the things that I want to highlight is with this funding, we were able to send people to UOP for their, um, for their, the drug counselor course, and and they're they're doing great you know this is this is this is huge it's something that i added to the reports and and uh and through uop they get and um the certificate and they're able to get the hours and they're able to really give back and i think that's the mentality moving forward that we had with every entity that we worked with um so that when it comes to the the training um i think we just lean on the performance that they have been, we lean on ETPL. That's why, you know, we have that system already in place that really uh, kept all of that under, under a, a watchful, a watchful eye of where we're spending our funding and, and, um, and where we are able to spend the training because we're already accustomed to doing that. Great. Thanks so much, Alfredo. Um, and then I think we have some, a lot of questions about sort of employer uh, partnerships and kind of building pipelines for P2E participants or just other participants um, to get connected with good quality jobs that can pay a real living wage, hopefully can, can, can sustain a family, provide benefits, uh, provide predictable hours, all those high road qualities we like to talk about at the state board. Um, so so maybe Dave and Amy, Amy, could you please talk a little bit about about how you build partnerships with employers um, and how you can sort of ensure that the, the jobs that we can try to send people towards will be those sort of high road jobs. So first off, uh, every workforce development board in the, in the state is tasked with maintaining a list of, of ex-offender friendly employers. And, and so that's where working through your AJCC will give you better results than just hitting indeed or monster.com or, or something like that. And so we first off already know who all the employers are in our area who 
are willing to hire um, ex-offenders. We also right. know a lot of them who prefer ex-offenders. We've heard them, we've had some employers say that some of these people have come out, you know, they're coming out of, after serving their time, just, just more resistant to making the same mistakes in their life. So they're actually better employees. And, um, and so that's, that's the first part. And then the second is we, when, when we do all these programs, we currently do like the one Amy just talked about our pre-apprenticeship program. We've had that going for several years now with, with, with the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, we can now leverage um, these PUC, I mean, I'm sorry, these um, P2E uh, participants in with these existing programs so that, so that we can sort of ins, uh, insinuate them into the existing programs that we have. And, and then the employers, you know, most employers don't come to us and say, I wanna hire an ex-offender. A lot of them will say, I don't care if they are or not, if they come to work, I don't care if they're ex-offenders. Now, there's some occupations where you can't be an ex-felon. It's not allowed. Um, right. and, and it's another thing the AJCC can help determine is, you know, you can't work at that company or you can't have that occupation, but here's a multitude of things you can do. And we, and we fold that into our, into our programs with our, with our employers. Thanks so much, Dave. And I think, and then we'll, I'll ask that same question to Alfredo. That'll be our last question for this panel. Um, and then we'll, we'll move on to our next, but go ahead, Alfredo. Thank you. Yeah. They, well, just, just like, uh, I think we've, we've had years of training in preparation for working with this. And I think of some of the training that I've had from Larry Robbins and in, in getting us ready, because the, right. that that's what we that's ask okay. about how to prepare the other mm -hmm. Uh, the employers for this, getting new employers and getting just like they've said, the ones that only want ex-offenders. Um, so it's working with them. And I think it's highlighting them, you know, and highlighting the employers and sharing their success with, with others. And you have to be careful with that. You have to be really careful when you share the employers um, because it's something that, that it, it can backfire. Um, so we we're very careful about that, but we do have that um, in, at the height of the COVID lockdown, the individuals that were coming in were the ex-offender population. They were here, they, they needed to go to work. They were getting, they were making our numbers look better. Um, and so that's something that I wanted to share. It's something the case managers did. We were sending them over, over the hill. They were in construction. So they were making those, those, those family sustaining wages that we talk about. But it's about just developing that relationship with the employer community. That's really what it's about um, to see what they have to offer. And we kept pushing that training that we've been receiving all along with this funding and, and with this, the, real, the regular uh, wheel of funding. As, as, um, as we train our staff on how to approach employers. All right, thank you, Alfredo. Yeah, the, the building relationships, sustaining partnerships, um, uh, you know, I think everybody who, who gets in this, who is in this line of work for a few days learns it really quickly that that's key, you know, maintaining those relationships, checking in, staying on the same page, yes. uh, you know, saying, what can I do for you? What can, you know, not just what you can do for me. Um, and so, Thank you all, Alfredo, Dave, Amy, really, really appreciate your time and the wonderful information you're sharing. Appreciate the great work you're doing for Californians uh, and particularly for the justice involved population. Uh, if I can just things, add, go ahead. I, I just wanted to add one more thing. If, if the state wants us, I think the one thing, one, the one thing I want to share is that if they do want input on how to design them, uh, a program, they can always, you know, ask, ask the locals about uh, Cal jobs reporting about, we were the squeaky wheel, San Joaquin, uh, you can, you can ask the state. We were always bringing up, why can't I get this report? Why can't, so uh, lean on us, uh, the, the locals, the boots on the ground to, to help design um, the, the reporting mechanism or, or help just even just promote or however we can get some advocacy behind getting more utilization out of Cal jobs. I couldn't look at anybody else's numbers so that's the other thing maybe that we can bring up um, in another session so thank you for the opportunity yeah we're going to look forward to that at, at our final session today and then next steps going forward and things things that we could do to make this even better for for the next round yes. um, all right thank you so much alfredo i know dave is going to stay on for our, our next panel and i'll just kind of move right into it so in the interest of time um making sure that we have enough time for lunch we also have uh, Michael Trogan from uh, the South Bay Workforce Investment Board, 
uh, joining us to talk about system-wide impacts uh, by grantees and, and really just discussing, you know, the idea of this is, is uh, you know, something that's might have begun at the local level um, and, and has really led to transformative, uh, transformational impacts outside of your region. You know, and, then, and that can, can, can be adopted and mimicked in other areas and, and then maybe even adopted statewide or, or, you know, California punches it pretty heavily at the national level too. I know we've got a lot of uh, interest from, from uh, Washington, D.C. about what's going on. Um, all right, so I'll, I think I'll just go ahead and, and get things started by allowing uh, Michael, please introduce yourself and your title, and then I'll go back to uh, David. Amy. Go ahead, Michael. Yep, sure. I'm Michael Trogan. I'm the Special Projects and Development Manager for the South Bay Workforce Investment Board, and I also served as the, the Regional Coordinator for LA County for P2E. Great, thanks. And uh, Dave, once, a, once again, please. Sure, Dave Taney, uh, Executive Director at the Mighty Motherload. Fantastic. And Amy? Amy Frost, Deputy Director at Mighty Motherload. All right. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Um, all right. Uh, I'm going to kick it off. Uh, Michael, Yeah, the, the LA region, the, the Los Angeles Basin region, has our largest population uh, in California and as well as our largest amount of, of P2E participants, which is very nice to see, at least that, that that's, that's, that's matching where all, where all the people are, that, that's where the, the participants are happening. Uh, could you maybe just kind of share your region's story in, in your approach to P2E and, and kind of briefly take us from, from start to finish and, and how that your, your plan has led to, uh, to lessons learned and, and, and you know, potential for statewide impact? Sure. Yep. Yeah. So, um, and I, I think LA is a huge region with a lot of people. We have seven boards, uh, over 40 AJCCs. Uh, it's big, it's complicated. Some are nonprofits, some are city departments. Nothing is uniform. Nothing was similar. We're all doing it. We work together here, um, you know, on different projects here and there, but there's no consistency across the board. And so uh, going back to even before P2E launched, there was the planning uh, pro process and planning grant that came out. And to me, that was where this whole, our whole success started in the planning component. And we launched a huge community, uh, we're gonna call it community workshop sessions, community input from stakeholders. We ended up hosting 24 sessions across the whole county. We had over 500 stakeholders come in. Uh, you know, it was not just workforce, it was, uh, you know, community organizations, county departments, probation, parole. Uh, we actually had a significant contingent of formerly incarcerated individuals that were just interested in showing up and giving feedback. And kind of the key to that planning piece was uh, it wasn't workforce led. Uh, we, our facilitators were from CBOs, they're from people working in the, the justice system. And so I don't know if some of you that have attended those kind of local regional plans that they do. Uh, it's always workforce, workforce consultants. You talk about workforce, workforce. We kind of took the opposite approach in, in this was truly one of the few like truly community input sessions uh, that we underwent. And kind of as we took all that information, those 24 sessions came back to kind of one big point, and it was the system, our system in LA is too big and too overwhelming. Again, we have like 45 AJCCs, but they're not just called AJCCs. Sometimes they're called one-stop centers. Sometimes they're called uh, work source centers, job and training centers. Even our name wasn't consistent across the 40. And so kind of what, what this group came back with the community input was, and what we decided was we had to shrink the system. Um, we had to concentrate resources and skills at, at a certain AJCC centers to ensure that when reentry individuals went to these centers, the proper services were there. It was consistent. They were having access to the same things. So we, we identified 15 of our centers and we designated them as reentry hubs. They were uh, coordinated kind of in their proximity as best we could to parole or probation offices so that people weren't going all the way across uh, the county to get services. And then what we decided is that at those hubs, at right off the bat, you had to have staff that were either familiar with working with the population or we also provided training. So you had staff that had expertise working in the population. Then we concentrated our P2E uh, training dollars and our paid work experience resources and supportive services. We concentrated them at those centers too. Because again, uh, you know, spreading P2E was a lot of money for our region, but when you spread it 45 ways, 
<laughs> you know, you're not serving as many people, you're losing the impact. So we concentrated in those centers so we could have the greatest impact. Um, and then we also, the, the third piece or the other big piece we had in there is we connected with community-based organizations um, and we had, we ensured that there was a person at each center that was, we, they, they kind of had different names. We call them community health workers, peer navigators, lived experience mentors. Some of that had been previously incarcerated that also worked with the system and they were kind of the gateway. And when you, when uh, reentry individuals came into one of these reentry hubs, there was somebody there to kind of welcome them, orientate them, help them go through those uh, supports. And then their other component of that was they were, also, uh, they de they were dedicated for the supportive services that workforce is not experts in. So that's things like mental health connection, getting your ID, legal processes, all those things that our case managers have always only referred out to. We now had somebody on site, um, or and eventually it was virtual because of COVID. Um, but they all connected, and, and that was ensured on site there. Um, and then the final piece, as a region, what we dedicated, uh, decided is we dedicated funds. All seven of us came together, gave a portion of our funds to do a system wide uh, live data reporting uh, dashboard. And, and, and so what this dashboard is, is it collected not only uh, data from Cal Jobs to report, it also we took. Uh, LA County probation had its own automatic referral system. We've talked about pivots from parole. So we actually went from the, started from the referral process, collected that data in, collected the Cal jobs data in, and then every partner, um, not just on the workforce partners, but parole, probation, any of the other people that were part of our MOUs and part of our agreements had access to this real-time data. And uh, can't underestimate, understate how important real-time data sharing is that you don't have to wait for somebody to send you a report once a month. Uh, but you're doing your own reports. You don't have to go back, dig through your emails to find a report. It's always there at your fingertips. Data's not there. You have to send somebody an email, say, hey, can you resend me that report? All that was eliminated because people were in real-time reading data. Uh, what we eventually found out is, you know, we've mentioned here too, there's been a lot of retirements, a lot of changeover in staff uh, with, pro with our justice, parole, probation, those different entities. And as we started meeting with the new people coming on and the newly assigned people, we realized they were already in the dashboard. They already had the background data. They knew the successes. They knew what was happening. So we didn't have to start from the beginning, get them caught up. The conversations then shifted. Okay, what's the next step? What are we doing? I see where we've gone so far. Um, and, and I wanna just demo real quickly the dashboard. Our dashboard was built in Microsoft Power BI, uh, which is it's part of the Microsoft 365 suite. So most of you have access to it. Um, and then we just carved out funds to have somebody actually develop the dashboard. And I just wanna show how complete and how much data we were able to share just using Cal Jobs and the referral system. So let me screen share this real quick. All right, is it there? Everybody can see the dashboard? Looking good. Looking good, okay. So this is our dashboard that we did. As you can see every week, it was uploaded so you had a real-time date of when the info was pulled out. Um, so went right down to, and then let me make sure it's switching for everybody to switch screens. You now see the, the ARS summary? Good, okay. So data on referrals. We tracked where the referrals went to, who, where they came from, uh, reasons why people didn't enroll. Uh, there's data in here on how long it took from the referral to the person reaching out and meeting with them. So from the parole and probation end, and for those direct line officers, this was invaluable data because they saw that their referrals were going somewhere, even if that person, as you see, 39% never got enrolled, but they saw why. And it wasn't just, a, I sent out 10, 15 referrals, never knew what happened with them. It was real-time data sharing. Uh, the next step was then we pulled from Cal Jobs, and you can see how many people we enrolled. Um, you could see the demographics where they broke out. You know, you get a lot of those questions of how many females have you served, all those different places. Um, we even busted out what types of activities they participate in, where they participate in the activities. Uh, we, when we would have our meetings, we would talk, you know, and all the AJCCs would be there. We didn't use this because we were able to be so successful. Uh, we didn't take this approach of, oh, you're not having enrollments, but there almost became friendly competition because they saw other centers and they could see their numbers and say, they're doing well, we got to catch up and do well there. Um, we looked at training. Um, again, you can see the training numbers, the employment numbers. Uh, again, this is, you know, we have almost 800 people that have been successfully uh, placed into subsidized employment or unsubsidized employment, sorry, permanent employment. And then you start to look at the fields, the things like that. We have the hourly wage. Uh, and then one of the other ones that I found 
valuable is this was a training cost versus wages. And our case managers throughout the whole region were able to go in and pull out and look at various trainings, how much they cost and what was the wage results afterwards. And so, um, you know, questions kind of come up of what jobs and what training are you putting in? Now here's another data set valuable that, that a case manager can look and say, oh, I understand that if I put this person into truck driving training, they're looking at $24, $25 an hour. Um, and so I can stop sharing, but to me, uh, this was a huge part of our success because we're such a big region. There's so many components, so many different players uh, that just managing and sending every information back and forth, it, that, that was a cumbersome activity in of itself. Uh, but so to me, that was a huge component of what we did. And then uh, kind of just to come out of that, we had to also, we've talked a little bit about the COVID pivoting. Uh, 30% of our entire budget was built in for paid work experience wages for participants. 50, almost 50% 50 of our participants were expected to go into a subsidized work experience placement. COVID hit, gone. You know, nobody, employers weren't bringing on anybody at the time. Nobody knew what was going on. Um, and so we were able to actually use the dashboard and the information to shift and we shift about 44% of our wages into training, you know, as we started looking at what trainings are coming out, which ones are in high demand and need, um, you know, as who could get going virtually. And, and so we were able to, to shift everything. And again, the data and that information sharing allowed us to make those shifts, look at what were the smart shifts. Um, you know, we, truck driving became our biggest probably training win. And that wasn't even on our radar when we started. P2E, but because of what happened during the pandemic, we were able to shift, show the data, move all those things over. Um, we ended up, I think we're, we're on pace to more than double the amount of people that we trained to this program when originally it was much more heavily focused on subsidized employment. We're actually now into the, the new interesting thing is subsidized employment has come back strong. And we actually, some places had to shift money back into subsidized employment because as things reopen, they're going back there. Um, and, oh, you know, I didn't never brought up my slides, but just kind of the overall success our original goal was 705 enrollments. We're up over 1,700. We're close to 240% over enrollment. Uh, we're 188% of our training goal. And I think at right now we're about 178 of our employment goal, but we also have over 200 people in subs currently in subsidized employment. So that's gonna jump up to over 200% as well uh, of people going into ideally permanent employment. Fantastic, Michael. That awesome numbers, awesome uh, uh, presentation, having the data like that, having those analytics is, is definitely something that we want to, to work on and just see how useful that is, um, you know, and to see how we can try to start, you know, working on this great work that you've done and, and trying to build on that and, 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 and have something like that statewide so that, uh, so that everybody can kind of get the sense. Of course, it's going to be different from region to region. Definitely, right? Every, different economies at different parts of the state, um, um, but just just really, really cool to see. Um, uh, Dave and Amy, uh, you've already told us about Motherland's partnership efforts, but I think, you know, really your presentation showed how you were able to sort of frame your grant pro or design your grant program around um, uh, building something that could be a statewide thing, you know, something that's, that's outside of, of, of the Motherland region. Um, so I don't know, maybe you could kind of share any advice you might have for other regions looking to make a system-wide impacts, you know, making a difference beyond their local region and kind of how to go about getting started. What are some of the first steps to do? Well, when we, when we saw the opportunity, um, yeah, we have some, uh, another small slide deck here. We already covered a lot of it in the last thing, but I can, I can run through it really quick. But when we, um, when we go ahead to the next slide. So when, when we took on this P2E grant opportunity, uh, we looked at where we can provide the most value. And, and I think everyone on this, on this webinar agrees that employment can reduce recidivism by who knows how many, I've seen so many different uh, numbers, but uh, one thing is, is in agreement is the sooner there's employment, the, the lower the recidivism. If you have a gap, then, then people can fall through the gap. So, and, and workforce services are proves, proven to increase employment. So the challenges are the justice involved often lack necessary skills for good jobs. And secondly, employers, some, some reploy, employers are reluctant to hire. Although, as we said before, some are, are, are eager to. So our solution that, that we put together was 
to promote early and continuous access to workforce services. So instead of waiting for someone to be released, we would serve them pre-release, but also make sure that there was a, a continuity between the pre-release and the post-release, which we talked about earlier. So pre-release for job readiness, post-release for implementation of that job plan, and hard handoffs all along the way. <clears throat> we have uh, two prisons in our area. So where, so the question is, where can motherload make the biggest impact? We have 8,000 inmates um, in our two prisons, but, but our supervised population is much more modest because of our lower population count. So we focused on, well, we have two prisons. We have 8,000 inmates. We can make an impact on a pre-release basis, which is why we focused on that. Go to the next slide. So already, we already talked about this, but Again, uh, the two pilots that that kind of we wanted to highlight as far as system wide impacts is the video and the video wasn't designed to be a mother load video it was it was designed to um, show the the uh, the statewide AJCC system. So no matter where you are, um, you can you can. That, that resource is available to you. And then P2E Jobs is the other one that I'll talk about here. We'll just skip through this this because we already talked about it the last one. Uh, go, go to State Pilot 1. Go back up. So one more, one more. So, so the videos, uh, as we said before, were designed not to just serve mother load, uh, but uh, to serve the entire state so that any, any prison or jail theoretically could have this dropped in and uh, they're 90 seconds each and they're going to be broadcast to inmates prior to release. So in the case of someone that's pre-released, um, they can look, in, they're or receiving pre-release uh, services. They have an AJCC in the prison and they'll be running P2E jobs, which is the version of Cal jobs that's been designed to run in the prison. And they'll have a job agent essentially from the AJCC that serves them. Not all, not every workforce area serves pre-release the way we do. Um, and so regardless of to what extent you're getting served pre-release, there's always going to be a post-release AJCC out there. Again, with Cal jobs, which would be a con continuum from P2E jobs and, an, and another job agent to carry on the, the work that's been done. So it promotes engage, early engagement uh, pre-release, but also continuity post-release so that the, that they're not starting all over again. And when they, when they, we just uh, worked with San Bernardino County on one where they, they took and honored sort of the pre-release work we had done and, and then started that uh, engagement with that, with when they were released to San Bernardino County, started that engagement with a lot of the work we had done behind, behind the, um, you know, pre-release. So, and Amy already talked about the intrinsic motivation concept of the videos. So uh, those are being finished here in the next two or three weeks. Uh, I'll go ahead into the next slide. And then Cal Jobs in the prison, you know, if we're going to put job agents or career counselors or whatever you call it, uh, case managers in the prison, it, it would be great to have their tool in there where they can uh, help design the right uh, program for that person and, and understand what jobs would be available in there. We're not, we're not trying to skill them up for jobs in, in where they're incarcerated, but, but rather where they're going to be released. And so um, Cal Jobs has all those capabilities, but up until now, we weren't allowed to bring Cal Jobs into the prison. So this is going to offer our Kate across the state, um, any, any local area, any AJCC that serves pre-release now can bring their tools. It's like, you know, before you had to go into the prison without your toolkit. Now you can go in with your toolkit and it's a toolkit that once you, once you tee that, that person up, when they're released, uh, all the work you've done will, will be con um, continued in, in the uh, destination um, uh, AJCC. And so this is one where we were told you can't get Cal jobs in the prison. It'll never get approved. Well, guess what? It's getting approved right now. Uh, we have it almost approved. We wanted to have, we wanted to be able to say that today, but it's not quite there. But um, with the cooperation of CDCR and their, and their IT folks, we're, we're about that far away from getting it approved. And then now we it just expands the, the footprint of the AJCC now to be pre-released and, and so, and, and so that, that work that's being done can be continued after the fact. And one more slide is the, um, this is what the actual uh, user interface looks like. So 
this was quite Michael, by the way, that's really impressive what you guys are doing uh, over there in LA. And we'd love to have our hands on your analysis tool. And this is what, you know, when we designed this, we also designed it to be used in other places like LA. So you can go into the prisons now and through P2E jobs, which is what we private labeled it. Uh, there's a p2ejobs.com website and you can log in and um, without fear of you know, backdoor, um, there's, there, the, the inmates are very creative on ways to, you know, get, get unauthorized access outside the, um, you know, the, the lockdown um, uh, software. So that's where most of the work has been done to kind of hermetically seal this so that it's, it's secure, but you've got all the um, tools that you would have with Cal jobs, or at least most of them and, and a secure environment. So um there's there's the actual uh I, I i was gonna do a demo but trust me it's real and it exists and uh that's the 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 splash page for it so those are the the two pilots really that were designed from the get-go to be system-wide impact pilots they weren't designed just for mother load that from the from the get-go we cooperate we we collaborated with the state board and and the and the uh, partnership with CDCR to make this a statewide. Um, these two things be, benefit the 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 system statewide. Okay, that's Thanks the so prepared much, stuff. No, yeah, it, it's just it's really really cool. I, I really loved watching the chat box as you were talking and just everybody celebrating these these great wins and and wonderful tools. Um, that we'll have going forward now and just be and showing how we can be really creative um, with the state dollars too. that P2E being a purely state funded program has given us so much more flexibility than the traditional, uh, you know, we owe models do. Um, um, so I think I, I want to start. For, so plug for the idea boards again, that they've been great. Um, and I, I want to get to the most upvoted question, which was about employers and jobs. And, you know, wh where are the employers today? Um, but Michael, I think just a little clarifying question about your um, uh, BI uh, dashboard and sort of how you incorporated that into Cal Jobs, you know, how you worked with your different CBOs in LA. Um, um, yeah, how do you make, when, when there's so many data systems, you know, how, how do you make it seamless if possible? If so, about that. yeah, well, first of all, I, I can't take the credit. This was uh, LA County WEDAX team that built the dashboard and collected all the data and they did the work. We just did the interpretation and reading, helping what should be on there. Uh, but there are a couple of challenges. You know, the primary source, well, there are three primary sources. One is, was again, the LA County probation referral system. Pivots, uh, you know, everybody here used the, that used the pivot system knows you got an emailed referral. Uh, feel bad. We had a great coordinator. She had the unfortunate task of hand entering all those referrals back into the system so that we could collect the data for parole as well because it wasn't automated, unfortunately. Uh, and then Cal Jobs was the other primary source. Uh, the challenge with Cal Jobs, again, is always it, the data is only as good as what people put in. And, and that is one of those ongoing challenges that you're always going to have. Uh, so <laughs> unfortunately too, uh, again, Jennifer Barnes, our coordinator, she had to every quarter match up data from Cal jobs with what was submitted to us by the seven boards and had that unenviable task of manually going through about 1700, 1800 uh, enrollments, looking at the data, making sure things matched all those types of things. Cause we wanted to make sure we were very accurate on it. Uh, but, but uh, that's going to always be the problem with any type of dashboard data reporting tool is it's only as good as what gets entered. And so you really have to start on the ensuring that you're training the people that are doing the data entry correctly and they know what they're doing. Could you maybe just really briefly on this topic, um, um, how do you, what are some of your best practices for verifying, you know, data that, that CBOs might be entering or that, that your partner, uh, that the other local boards in your region because um, we've talked about challenges that, you know, you can't see their data. Alfredo brought that up earlier. Yeah. You know, how, how do you go about so, doing that? So, so we, we were lucky uh, that LA County has access to the data for all seven boards and, and we're allowed to look at it. So we were able to compare the data that they were able to pull versus the data that was being sent to us individually uh, on those levels. Um, but I, I mean, 
we did it by hand. So if there is a best practice, I'd also like to hear it. You know, it's tough. It was a lot of manual labor and, and on the, there, just making sure things were right. Uh, you know, working, you know, as she, as our coordinator, as she noticed inconsistencies, she was able to then go back to that board and to those CBOs and say, hey, you know, we got to work on data from that center. Again, reducing it from 45 AJCCs to 15, you know, it was a third less of what you'd have to deal with. So there was, um, we were able to concentrate trainings in those hubs to make sure that they really knew what they were doing, um, you know, because it was such a big system, it's so inconsistent. Um, that was part of why our plan, uh, you know, was to, to really focus on and ensure at, at those 15 hubs, really strong. Yeah, just some serious heavy lifting you all did down there. And it's it's really cool uh, to hear about it. And um, thank you. <laughs> you know, thank you on behalf of the state for, for putting all that work in. Um, all right. So I want to ask the question. I think I'll, I'll start with uh, with Mother Load and then go back to Michael. You know, the most upvoted question was just where where are the jobs? You know, um, so I don't know. I don't know. However, you want to answer that question. Just kind of maybe you could list off some of your top employers um, that, that, that have been really, um, you know, helpful and, and have been really great working uh, with, with the P2E program. And, uh, you know, as, as far as where are the employers today, you know, I, I, I guess the, uh, the email list that we use to invite people might not have directly included employers. We encourage everybody, anybody who wants to come is welcome to be here today. But it, it's, it's, a, it's a good question, you know, one that, that we'll let. So um, uh, Dave and, and Amy, if you could kick us off with uh, just where and who are the employers uh, that, that, that are working with the P2E participants? Well, so I'll, kick, I'll, I'll give my two cents. Maybe Amy can throw in too, but uh, construction, there's certain industries, for instance, uh, in general, one of our biggest uh, occupations, in-demand occupations is health, in healthcare, our nurses and nursing assistants, but there's actual prohibition on, on um felons, you know, people with a, a felony uh, working in those fields. So we don't focus so much on, on that industry, but construction um, is a good industry for us to target. We also, we have a, a large um, forestry and timber uh, business up here. Um, this is where your wood comes from. Um, we, we cut down trees and make things out of them. And, um, and so that's another area that we're, we're, we're having success. We've also done entrepreneurs, uh, which is sort of a new thing for us, but uh, some people coming out of the P2E program have wanted to start their own business and we have funded that. Uh, one person does a power washing business to power wash buildings and the like, and he's been very successful at it. So we bought some power washing equipment for him and, and got him set up. So Amy, do you have any other ideas on that? Yeah, exactly. It's just about um, looking at the larger employers who can easily onboard um, justice involved, but at also fostering those relationships that um, because there are private employers who have the ability to hire justice involved. And um, also a big industry for us has been the um, manufacturing as well. That employer has stated they prefer justice involved because they're so loyal and grateful for a second chance to do it right. And so, um, and then the entrepreneur too is, is listening to the employers. What's the need? Okay, here's an entrepreneur. If you have this certificate, then you can serve these restaurants that are not being served. That was another thing that we were able to do was to train um, in these different fields where, where there was nobody certified to do the job in our area. So that, that was a shoe in for, for that too. So listening to the need, providing a solution. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and and Michael, how would you answer that question? Where and who are the employers? Uh, so, that, go ahead. Sure. You know, I'll, like, construction traditionally has always been the biggest easy route. Um, but what we found through the pandemic was it was trade and logistics. It was truck driving. Again, that was our biggest winner. Um, but also looking at warehouses, uh, packaging, all those types of jobs where people were working in that became huge. I, you know, we'll look a few years down the road if, if it's because of the pandemic increased need in those areas um, or, or if it was there. You know, when we looked at construction too, um, one of the things that came out of P2E that we also didn't think about was we got uh, long-term formerly incarcerated people, people that have been in for 20 plus years. And it's a lot different when you're in your 50s and 60s and you're coming out to get a job to do a manual labor 
construction job than when you're 18, 19. And so we had to look at the shifts there as well. Um, the, uh, one of the other, actually in our biggest, as I'm looking at our dashboard now, our biggest one was professional business services. And that was maintenance, cleaning, um, those jobs in and around office buildings, things like that. That ended up being one of our biggest employers uh, during the project as well. Driving was big for us too. Yeah, yeah, I think it was big across the state. It was mm -hmm. we couldn't put enough people through it, to be honest. Could could we all maybe discuss a little bit about sort of high road uh, principles and just you know trying to focus you know uh, you know with with P2E participants and and given the immense barriers these individuals face, we are we are so happy uh, to see to see un, you know unsubsidized employment no matter where it is. But 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 how, how do we balance, you know, still trying to focus on that effort about looking for high road employers and high road careers? Um, you know, could you maybe talk about some of the challenges that, that you know, and maybe it's some tips to, to help individuals succeed and find those types of careers? Sure, you want me to go first? Yeah, go ahead. Mike. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, so some of the, the our big fields had unions built in. So high road is just a component of that. When you look at construction, they're already part of the high road model. You have your pathways to move up. And some of those fields are easier. Uh, and, and I know somebody put in a comment here. This is another thing we started to notice during this time is uh, employers that weren't traditionally open to the population that we're having labor shortage, things like that are becoming more open manufacturing, uh, especially in our area, because we have so many defense contractors that manufacturing was not an open, um, an open sector for this population at all. And we're now starting to see a change. Obviously, defense contractors can't do it. But defense contractors are hiring people up, we're able to backfill some of those other contractors and positions into this and, and, and really looking at uh, not not in our mind shutting down that, that, like you said, just getting them a job, getting them on some size appointments good enough. Uh, but what, what are we putting our other participants in? Where are the high road jobs that we're doing and, and working on what, addressing those barriers to funnel the, the reentry population into those jobs as well? I, I think it's, it's almost more on our mindset and our staff and our workforce system that, that we shouldn't pigeonhole them into careers, but look at what are the careers in the high roads careers in our areas that are hiring and how do we get formerly incarcerated individuals into those careers? I, I would just add to that, Go ahead. that yeah. um, maybe it's COVID or the post COVID sort of what is, what's it called? The mass resignation of, of, of a lot of people not re-entering the workforce. And, and so employers are, are a lot more, I don't want to say desperate, but they're, they, they've changed their, their rules on, on what's acceptable and what's not. And, and if they find someone that's, that's willing to work and come to work and show up on time and, you know, uh, not go out on a bender or something that they're happy with that. And they don't, they don't care so much what their background is. Um, and, and so unless it's prohibited by certain uh, licensing boards, which sometimes it is um, uh, there, there, I think the willingness to hire um, the justice involved in, in all the high road occupations is, is really changing now. Right, and I see in the chat too, people are saying to educate the employers and that is indeed a necessary step is to also educate on the bonds that are available, the um, safeguarding programs that are in place, the credits for hiring, things like that. Thank you, thank you. All right, maybe uh, we'll see if this might be our final question before lunch at 11.45. Um, but, but really good question. I think one that we didn't talk much about yet um, about, about health barriers to employment, particularly mental health. Um, are you able to share how mental health is considered when helping individuals prepare for uh, re-entry, prepare for employment? Um, I think I'll go with, we'll start with Michael, just keep in order uh, and then move back to Mother Lou. Sure, yep. And so mental health, that was part of our program model. I talked about, we called them community health workers, peer, band, peer navigators, whatever the title was. That was part of the intake orientation session was to connect with that person and address those. And a lot of times, or several times, if those were issues were there, they would connect with that worker to deal with those those and get those supports and then move them on to training. You know, so, so it came in the forefront. We were dealing with that, identifying who had that need right up front, 
incorporated a worker as part of our model to, to address those issues. So um, I guess I would, I would add in that um, we actually have uh, placed people, we've leveraged P2E with our opioid uh, grant that we had, um, which is winding down or maybe already has wind, wound down. But um, we're, we've actually placed justice involved with in, in positions, in, in, in careers where they become counselors and mental health counselors and, and, and substance abuse counselors. And so um, from the standpoint of, of mental health, someone wrote in the, in the chat that not everybody's ready for a job. And so we, we expect our, our CDCR partners to do some eligibility and, 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 and train or not training, but, you know, to, to help refer people that they think are ready and, 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 and don't need additional mental health um, uh, services. But uh, for some of some people who've been through that, um, that uh, process, placing them in, in counseling roles where they've got firsthand experience of, of, of these things really has helped, uh, I think, uh, solve that crisis for them and, and gives them, makes them better counselors overall. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, so I think we're going to um, go ahead and move to our lunch break. Uh, we are going to be hearing more uh, from Mother Lode um, on our next panel, which is going to be success stories uh, that, that as told by the, by the participants of, of P2E and um, um, San Diego uh, local board will be coming back on to share a success story. Um, so I want to thank you all. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Dave, Amy, uh, uh, for, for sharing with us being here today. Thank you for the great work again that, that you're doing. It's really exciting to hear. And, and it's just, it, it's, it's such an overwhelmingly positive vibe that, that we're getting today and around from around the state. And, and we're really excited um, about what's been done and, and what's being done and what's going to be next. Thanks, um, Travis. We appreciate yeah, thank you. the invitation. Thank you. Can I just add, it's great to be on the panel showing we're probably one of the smallest regions and LA is one, one of the largest, if not the largest, but we're all, we're all coming up with innovative uh, solutions. So it's, it's really great to be part of this, this team. Yes. So thanks. Absolutely. All right. So with that, let's go ahead and break for lunch. We're playing in about 30 minutes. Um, we'll be back at 1215. It is important uh, that some of our participants have had to request time off. So, you know, to be here today. So we're definitely going to be starting on time for that, just, just to let you know. Um, but thank you. And we'll see you back uh, in 30 minutes. All right. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to our Prison to Employment Summit. Uh, hopefully you had a, uh, had a chance to get some lunch. We have two more panels left today. Uh, and I do, I do want to acknowledge um, the chat. The chat has been awesome. It's been on fire. And I, uh, we saw notations of be, uh, making sure we all use uh, person-first language. And, and this, is all, this perfectly sets up our next panel. And when Travis and I, we had discussions when planning this summit. When do we put our participants on, uh, on the agenda? Do we do it first or do we do it towards the end? And so uh, I want to acknowledge that, yes, it's very important to us here at CWDB, me personally, that we do uh, address our folk in the appropriate language because as we, we, we heard in a, in a different panel, it is systems changing. And part of that systems changing is to change our language, how we address uh, the justice involved. Um, I know there's technical terms in statute that identifies these folks, but that doesn't mean we have to use said terms. It's, it's an admin thing and we're changing that. We're, we've been adding person first language. Um, and also, I wanted to also recognize that, you know, we structured this summit to start with our statewide partners at Corrections and our partners of what they did to adjust in COVID and their partnerships but we also wanted to be as intentional uh, with uh, test personal testimonials from the participants themselves. It's at this point of the agenda that we, we ended up putting right after lunch and right before our deputy director. But we, I, I just want to acknowledge that um, that is very important to us. And um, 
So I'll just end with that. And with that, um, Diana, if Diana, if you're if you're online, uh, I want uh, to introduce you so you can introduce your person, Miss Wendy Ortiz. There you go, Diana. Hi, how are you? Good to see you again. Great to be here. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. So sorry about that little uh, intro. I, uh, I just wanted to acknowledge the chat. And I know it's, you know, having conversations with you, I know that's been very personable and it's going to reflect in Miss Wendy's uh, presentation, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw it to you to introduce your person and their lived experience. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, it is with great pleasure that I introduce you to an inspirational human being, a woman who is defeating the odds by overcoming the past, shutting down stigmas, conquering her fears to live out her fullest potential. Ms. Wendy Ortiz was referred to prison to employment back in 2020, eager to begin a new life. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Ms. Wendy Ortiz. Hello, everybody. I am nervous. I'm not going to lie. Uh, my name is Wendy, and I am a recovering addict. Um, I'm just very um, blessed and, and very grateful that you guys are giving me this opportunity to share um, with you guys my experience. Um, just life experience and my experience through this program that just gave me just what their name is, a second chance. Um, it's just so amazing, a little bit about myself. Um, I was homeless for a lot of years due to um, bad decisions I made in my life. And I, like I said, I became homeless, um, sleeping from the car to the tent, to the tunnels. And I just had no hope in my life. I had nothing, no confidence. I was just a lost soul. And um, due to my decisions in life, my bad decisions, I ended up being incarcerated. And um, I just knew when I was incarcerated that that's not the life I wanted anymore. I wanted a change. Um, and of course, due to my bad decisions, I burned a lot of bridges. It got to a point where nobody wanted me in their lives. Um, he didn't believe in me anymore just because I kept saying the same thing and going, you know, doing the opposite. And um, I know when I got out of jail, I ended up being in this program, um, Tom McAllister. I did an inpatient and an outpatient. And um, after I was done with my rehab program, it was just like almost like a dead end. I didn't know what to do. I was lost. I just know. I didn't want to go back to the streets. And um, my calister, I reached out to my counselor and I um, told her, you know, that I, I needed help, guidance. And they referred me to the Work First program where I met Dee, that she has become more than a mentor to me. Um, more than a mentor. It's almost I see her like family now. And it's just, she inspires me daily. Um, I remember her reaching out to me and hearing me out and referring me to the Second Chance program. And that's how I heard about um, the P2E and um, JRT. And, you know, at first they were telling me all these letters and numbers. I didn't understand none of it. I was like, P2E, JRT, I just don't know. I need a change. And so they, you know, took their time, explained all that to me, what it meant. And um, it was just so amazing because um, Scott took, you know, time from his busy schedule, set up a big group of people, and they just did a Zoom meeting through me with me. And um, they explained to me everything they have to offer. And, I mean, they even... It, they offer so much that they didn't even tell me everything I was really going to get. I was just like, wow. Um, so this program have done so much for me. Um, this month on the 7th, I'll be three years sober. Um, I just don't know how I could have done it without this program. Um, when I first came in, I always say I was a body without a spine. 
I didn't have support. I didn't have anything until I got into this program. They became my spine. They became my support. Um, they were able to lift me up because I, with my background being a felon, I just didn't thought I had any hope for my future. I, I just thought that that was it for me. And um, they helped, they lift me up. You know, they used their hands, they lift me up. And they, to this day, they have not let me go. It's been over a year that I graduated from this program. They still reach out to me. I reach out to them if I need any assistance. They um, help me to build my resume. They help me to do interviews, how to answer those hard questions where I had all those gaps. Um, they just kept telling me, Wendy, your past doesn't define your future. And that was something major for me and it hit me hard. And when they told me that, I just knew that I just, since day one, I knew I was in the right place. And the class was amazing. It was just a couple of weeks, but during those couple of weeks, I got so much out of the program, more than what I was expecting. And it was just, wow. I, you know, I when I got out of, um, being incarcerated is when COVID hit. So everything was shutting down, everything. Um, so I'm fighting everything shutting down. I'm fighting my addiction. And I was just fighting. And I just, I just felt like, you know, everything's shutting down right now. How am I gonna get a job? You know, and, and they will come to my house with their mask on. They will help me to fill out applications. They will help me how to use a computer. I didn't know how to use a computer. I didn't know about Zoom. These people became more than just counselors. They were like tech support, all types of support. And, um, you know, they will come to my house. They help me fill out my application. Um, right now, due to their help and support, I'm back in school. I'm going to school right now to become a registered nurse. I've been in the medical field for a very long time and I had, you know, lost it for a little bit and they got me back in the medical field. I'm back in the medical field doing something that I love. Um, just, you know, it's just, I love helping people and I just knew this field, it, it's a fit for me. And, you know, they work so hard to get me back in the medical field um, little did I know that when I was doing the mock interviews there with them, that the person that was doing the mock interview was actually was going to be the one that was going to be hiring me. And so that, you know, they just gave me a, a big opportunity. They knew my background. Um, I was able to use everybody from the second test program as references. Um, you know, they just spoke very highly of me. They just helped me put my foot in. Right now, it's been a little bit over a year of me working there. I've gotten a few promotions already. I'm one of the side leads of the nurses. I work at the corporate office right now, um, helping um, the business grow. We're doing COVID-19 testing. I help them to get um, grants from the county. Um, so right now we have even we're working with the county and it's just all because they believed in me and just because I had the support that I needed, I can't, you know, I keep saying that spine, a body without a spine can't walk, can't do anything. And that's what this program became was they became my, my spine to where they were able to encourage me and help me to get where I'm at today. I just know for a fact, if, I would never gone to this program. I would not be where I am today. And it's just all because of them. I mean, I could just go on and on with everything they did for me. And, you know, they give you one counselor, but that one counselor is not just your one counselor. It's everybody helps out. Everybody steps in and wherever they can help you, they help you if you need to call, you're not going to get an operator and press this, press that. It's like right away, they pick up the phone, they answer your questions. If you leave a message less than five minutes, they're calling you back. 
like, hey, you know, what do you need? You know, it's always, what do you need? What, how can we help you? Um, anything I needed when I first started, I didn't have clothes. They gave me clothes to start a job. They helped me with transportation. Um, man, what they didn't help me with. They, they just, if I needed gas money, they would give me gas money. Um, I had no form of doing the class without a laptop. They provided me with the laptop. That's the laptop I'm using today to be in this meeting. Um, it's the same laptop I'm using today to go back to school, do my classes online. It's the smallest things that are major that can make a difference in someone's life. And, you know, I thought this laptop was just going to be, it was like lens. You know, here, use it for now and figure it out later. No, when I was going to return it, they're like, no, that's yours. And it's just those things like that that just encouraged me to continue on doing what I'm doing. And to this day, I just have all that support. If I need them for anything, like they're just there for me at all times. But anyways, you guys, thanks for letting me share my journey my hope my inspiration and, and i just very grateful for this program i couldn't have done it without it thank you guys thank, thank you, you so much wendy you're such an amazing person and we thank you for sharing your story i also want to shout out to our program partner um second san diego second chance the p2e team you all are rock stars we work together we are a team and um, wendy keep on going girl we're here for you. All right. Thank you so much, Wendy. And thank Deanna, you, PWDB. Deanna, I know this was when we talked about this back in November, how this was going to be so super awesome. Uh, so, Wendy, thank you very much for your lived experience, uh, your testimony on you, you were, you're exemplifying everything we've been talking about all afternoon. Uh, Dee, I know she she told about her story. If you want to pepper in any other uh, items in, in this uh, testimony, this lived experience that you all did. Uh, I know she said the device. I know that uh, when she said that, I was like, yeah, she said it. Um, and then maybe uh, we can cut and paste you know, the chat box. It, just send it to her, the amount of support that she's receiving in the chat uh, uh telling her story so d uh, before we um before we end your 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 all's uh portion yeah i, I you know i just want to highlight some things like where where the position that wendy is in as she shared she's received several promotions um and not only that she has definitely been the um the gatekeeper for others who have similar backgrounds and getting an opportunity working in the field that she's working in. And um, what, what a testimony. Um, she's a straight A student in uh, college, woo -woo, you know, and um, she's just doing wonderful things. And um, with the, the team, um, her case manager, Diana, the program manager, uh, Scott Taylor, he's on the call uh, on the summit today. And us just working together and seeing what we can do um, to, to provide, you know, the best support for Wendy. We definitely believe in that team-based case management, which is just a collaboration and partnership with all of our community partners and making it work, uh, making it happen. And I think that's, you know, just what added to, um, you know, the, the support that Wendy uh, was able to receive. We, we understand that employment's not the end all be all, it's just the beginning uh, for Wendy to, Wendy to, you know, just live her best life. And so just wanted to like put that in there, put that little um, flavor in there for you. And um, she's continuing to thrive. Like she said, she's working at the corporate office. So she's been assisting you know, um, this uh, company expanding because of, of, of who she is and what she's capable of doing. Her skill sets are just amazing. One last question for Wendy yourself. Uh, we're going to share these videos with our correction partner and those folks that are still in the inside ready to come home. Uh, is there any one piece of advice now that you're you're two years, three years into this journey? Some of these folks are not, you know, they're going to come home relatively soon. Uh, is there anything you want to say to them directly uh, regarding, um, you know, your experience? And you're on mute, just a FYI. Thank you. 
That's one thing I would like to just let them know. It's like my grandma will always tell me, close mouth, don't get fed. You know, if you speak and let them know how they can help you and what you need, they will go out of their way to help you and support you to get exactly where you want to be in life or just what you, your needs, your needs. We lose an album. We're out there. We have nothing and coming back out. You're still in the same boat as when you went back in when you went in and you know, the, they're here to help you, to support you, to get everything back that you lost plus 10 times more than you can just imagine. It's just pretty much letting them know your needs and how they can help you and assist you. And that's pretty much it. You know, just open your mouth so they could feed you what you need to grow in, in life and be successful. Thank you, Wendy. Kristen, Diana, Wendy, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for sharing what it, what true partnership means, what supportive services mean uh, when helping out our justice-involved individuals and population, that this is why, this past few hours, this is exactly why we do what we do. Thank you very much for joining us today. And with that, and the, the fun doesn't stop here, we are, we are going to bring up Mr. James Hansen from Motherload to introduce his success story, Mr. Eric Kyle. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is James Hansen, and I am a case manager for the Mighty Motherload here in Sonora. And uh, first, I'd just like to say thank you, Wendy. Your, your story was one of hope and inspiration for, you know, justice-involved participants everywhere. Um, so I have been, I have had the opportunity to assist many justice-involved participants through this P2E grant. And I don't necessarily feel that, well, yes, the statistics and the numbers are very important and they show very much so a positive, moving in a positive direction. It doesn't necessarily encapsulate how this program and how this grant was able to actually change people's lives and help them to really truly follow their passions. And when I was asked if I knew anyone on my caseload that had, you know, great success, you know, the first person that came to mind was Mr. Eric Kyle. You know, he's shown extreme hard work and dedication towards working towards his goal of working in water treatment. So it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Eric Kyle, who's going to share his experience with the P2E grant and how it was helpful in changing his life. Eric, you're on mute. You're on mute, Eric. How's that? Okay, cool. I switched over to my phone because uh, my camera's not working for whatever reason. I need to be seen, I guess. <laughs> Um, I really appreciate this opportunity. Uh, it's uh, P2E has been been uh, instrumental in where I'm going these days. Uh, uh, my background is I, I was a uh, justice involved uh, from 1991 to uh, 2009, uh, in and out of jails, prison, uh, rehabs. Um, I'm a drug addict in recovery. I uh, was. Uh, <clears throat> uh, finally sent by the courts to uh, rehab in uh, San Francisco in 2009, where I, uh, uh, you know, obtained some, some, some sanity and got, uh, got into a, the hospitality industry. Um, and I, I, I did pretty well in that. Um, I uh, stayed in the Bay Area for uh, 10 years. So I didn't get into the P2E program until I had been at, uh, out of jail systems and, and uh, been, um, away from that uh, lifestyle for uh, 10 years, but uh, I found that in the COVID came, I, uh, I uh, relapsed in, uh, in 2020 and, uh, and it, was, it scared me and I didn't know what to do. I had a friend that was in the Sonora area. I, just, I really wanted to move home. I came up here, I seen that she was involved with something. Um, I asked her what it was about. She was getting into a water treatment field I was real curious about how that could work for me. Um, I, I felt like the crossroads were looking me in the face again. You know, I had been clean for a long time, and uh, and you know, I know what comes with that for me is jails, institutions, and so I uh, reached out to the P2E program, 
um, and uh, started getting uh, a lot of answers. Uh, you know, I found it very, very, very valuable. Uh, lots of help, lots of uh, support. I felt like, uh, the, like Wendy said, I felt like I didn't have uh, any, you know, support backbone to anything moving forward. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to, I obviously had a career change coming, COVID shut down the whole restaurant industry for a while. Um, yeah, uh, let's see. So, so I found the interest in, you know, moving forward, I found an interest in uh, water treatment. I uh, found that there was a lot of support and help from James and other people at Mother Low Job Training. I, uh, I started just doing whatever it took and what was needed to be done. I, uh, you know, if they had a form to fill out, I just did it. I, if I needed to, uh, you know, take a, an assessment test, I did that. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's about putting in the work, I guess. Um, yeah, I, uh, I found a lot of, uh, I mean, if, if I needed, I didn't have any skills uh, coming out of that. Uh, the Bay Area, I didn't have any skills as far as, you know, computer use, uh, building resumes or application process, how to even get stuff printed at my house. So um, they were very helpful for that. They still are. I, I feel very supported, continuing to be supported. I've uh, uh, presently, I've, I've passed uh, several uh, state tests for water treatment and distribution. Um, I've... Uh, Recently, just become employed by a local utility in a temporary basis, um, and uh, I don't find a lot of pushback for that. I, I think I carried around my record with me more than other people do. I found that there's a lot of open-mindedness to, um, especially in the trades. Yeah, like I was, I was been watching the, the the summit here, and and I really appreciate everybody and and what appreciate the uh open mindedness to to the community and um and like it's been said i think the trades are a little more easily open minded to that and some some even really encourage those type of people to be involved or people like myself to be involved in their trades because we can be very the loyal uh, employees and hard workers um like i was saying i think i carry around my my uh my record more than most, you know, it's, it's in my head. It's, it's my worries. Um, yeah, I do have a little bit of time distance between my last incarceration and, and any kind of probation. So it, it does help. Um, moving forward though, anybody coming out new, I, I really appreciate the, hearing that this, uh, P2E is, is inside the walls. I didn't, uh, realize that knowing, not knowing that, but, uh, yeah, I am. Yeah. I'm a little bit nervous too, but, um, you're doing a great job. Right. Yeah, it's like it's a, it's amazing. I mean, to be supported by uh, you know some people that you know it it is it was difficult at first with the COVID, you know, and the masks and the knocking on the door and and waiting outside and stuff, which is understandable. And um, you know, but now we're getting a little bit more personal and in the offices, it's kind of nice. And uh, to be able to have somebody you know hold your hand and and help you create a resume and, you know, and know uh, how to navigate through a keyboard on a computer and, and show you uh, the resources. Um, James, Mr. Hansen is like, is like really, really instrumental in, in helping me navigate my way through websites and, and job boards and, and uh, allowing me to, or sending me and forwarding me uh, job postings. And I, I could, I couldn't praise P2E enough. And I'm, 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 like I've told him, I'm willing and totally uh, available to, to share my experience with the next people that come in, and I'll be available for that always. And so moving forward, I finally gained employment. So I think that the P2E program is definitely successful. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Eric. And James, the same question to you that I asked Diana with Miss Wendy. Uh, is there anything else in his testimony you want to pepper in as far as any additional supportive services or anything else that Mother Lo did to have such a good success story? 
Yeah. So, you know, like Eric was saying, you know, we were able to assist him with a multitude of different things, but, you know, outside of just having justice involvement as a barrier, you know, then all of a sudden we also have COVID, you know, so everybody's lives were turned upside down and everything was just, you know, a little bit hectic for everyone, you know, but we were able to persevere and be very creative in the ways in which we were able to provide these assistances. You know, we were able to, you know, locate a school that was very helpful and very supportive in helping someone obtain their certificates and water treatment. They were able to really, you know, support the individual through, you know, one-on-one -on -one Zoom sessions to ensure that they understood the math that would be required for distribution and treatment. You know, outside of that, with COVID, with not being able to work, with being in school, you know, you look at, you know, housing. If you don't have housing or you don't have technology, you know, a home base in which you can operate from to make yourself successful, you know, we were able to assist, you know, with a supportive service to help him with his rent so that, you know, he was able to maintain his place of residence and really, you know, help set the foundation for his success. You know, Eric didn't necessarily touch on it, but even, you know, going forward after completing his initial training, he's now seeking to, you know, gain his collection certificate, you know, and to continue to persevere forwards in the field of water treatment, you know, to increase his upward mobility to leave, you know, what's happened in the past in the past. You know, I thank you so much, Eric, for sharing your story with us today. Really, when I think of a hardworking and dedicated individual that I've had the opportunity to serve, you're the first person that comes to mind. So thank you, Eric. Thank you. Joe, can I just add something real quick? Go right ahead. I was um, about to, I was going to go to you. So yeah, go right ahead. <laughs> Excuse me. Travis uh, had asked earlier about helping people find high road jobs. And, and in our area, up in the mountains, we're a, we're a watershed area and and so um you know we have reservoirs and 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 watershed that that uh, uh you know produces water professionals and water water management people and so that is a high road job in our area and and those jobs are aging out right now from people that are retiring and so for eric to get into that job uh hits right in the bullseye of one of our high road um career paths in in the mother love Thank you for that, Dave. And then Eric, you know, last question to you, just same uh, that I asked Miss Wendy, uh, you know, we're sharing this with the folks that are still on the inside, your journey, it's been a, a couple of years, if there's any piece of advice um, that you can give those individuals who are about to return home, uh, what would it be? I know you kind of started on that path, but, uh, you know, any, any more, more advice that you may have? Yeah, absolutely. Um, give yourself a break, you know, and uh, and don't be afraid to ask questions, press in and, um, you know, see what's available. Be curious about the uh, different fields that are offered. There's uh, quite a few from what I understand, uh, you know, and like it was a gentleman from L.A. say a lot of truck driving uh, was, you know, picked up and that's a, a, a huge thing going on right now. But uh, coming out of it, uh, yeah, uh, and don't don't wear that. Uh, record as like a as a badge of dishonor you know it's it's just uh it's it seems to be like more you know important in my head than it is theirs you know and there's ways around it there's uh definitely you know um laws that are in place now that make that uh question that used to be on every application a little different you know it's um you know uh yeah it seems to be like my you know felonies or my uh, I mean, my record is, you know, seems to be uh, something that I hold on to more than I think my employers do. Um, and just moving forward, I, you know, it, once we gain more time, you know, in uh, in society and in 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 life, then uh, that moves farther away from you. So, don't give up. Thank you, Eric. Dave, Amy, James, Eric, thank you very much representing Motherload. Um, we couldn't have done this summit without your collective testimonials, but Eric, you were the star of the show. So um, we, uh, CWDB wants to express our thanks for uh, assisting us in our summit today, showing the personification of what we're all doing here. So uh, thank you very much, everybody on the team Motherload team. Nice, nice job, Eric. And then with that, we're, we're um, with these two testimonials, this is just two 
of over 5,000 participants that this uh, this P2E grant has served. Um, I know you all who are still on the line with us uh, have your own personal stories to share and the successes you've seen out there in the field. Uh, if you can, go, I know we've thrown the idea boards up there. If you can just, you know, make, uh, if you can post some of your success stories or successful elements that you've seen out in the field with this grant. I know it's just two stories that we heard today of the many, many, many uh, that are out there. And um, again, we we didn't know where to place this, but I think towards the end to oh, that we can have that collective uplift to hear that inspiring story, uh, the the triumphs of just working hard, like how they said it, they they did the work too. Uh, we we just provided those supportive and direct services to make sure that they. Um, see successes in uh, here in the state of California. Um, with that, we're gonna go into our final panel. I'm gonna bring up uh, Curtis Natsuna, our deputy director here at CWDB uh, for, his, for our future of the Prison to Employment Grant Initiative. Um, so let's bring him up. There you are, I know you're in the, the next room over. Um, I mean, Curtis, we've heard fantastic testimonials this afternoon. Our, our panelists had some great um, stories that, you know, that we've all collectively have done over this last two, three, four years of planning this grant initiative to be where we're at today. You know, uh, I know you have a couple of words to say uh, based on what we've heard already this afternoon. Uh, so I go to you for uh, some of your comments. Thank you. All right, thanks, Joe, and uh, hello to everybody joining us today. As Joe said, my name is Curtis Natsuna, and I'm the Chief Deputy and Chief, Chief of Staff here at the California Workforce Development Board. And I have the privilege of helping wrap up today's activities uh, with some thoughts on looking forward. But uh, first, uh, I wanted to thank our team here at the CWDB uh, who worked together to put this event together. Um, who, who are running the mechanics um, behind the scenes so that we can share all of the good work happening with P2E. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, Joe Flores, Dr. Travis Baker on our P2E team, Angela Mendibles and James Hill from our program team, Anna Champi, Jeff Jacobstein, Ross Viegas, Aldo Montijo, Michael Dowdy, and Evelyn Kuzmenko from our admin team, and Miranda Love from our executive office. Uh, second, I just, I wanna thank all of today's presenters um, from our fellow state agencies, from our local workforce partners, uh, and the amazing participants who shared their journeys with us today. Uh, we see you, uh, we appreciate your lived experience, and those of us who understand recovery know that uh, sharing your story is powerful. Uh, and it's healing, it's part of the healing process. So, so thank you for that. Um, and, you know, to the hundreds of people uh, participating in today's digital summit, um, thank you for joining us. Um, so, so, so what's next? And, um, and where do we go from here? Well, on the, uh, on the state side, uh, we're excited to continue our partnership with CDCR, uh, CalPIA, um, Government Operations Agency, Caltrans, uh, and others to continue to really work to align our systems, uh, build connectivity, uh, and help our local partners, as you've heard several examples today, navigate our systems. Um, that's really you know, our, our role, right? That's, that's where the state leadership comes in, uh, and to really work um, with you all to find better ways and more opportunities to collaborate. Um, I really uh, appreciated Brant and Ryan uh, earlier uh, sharing some of that early history uh, from a few years ago uh, when, when we all sat down together, uh, when we were convened. And, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I remember just, you know, looking at each other and, you know, I think we were probably all asking ourselves, well, you know, where's this gonna go? Right. How, how do we, how how are we going to align, you know, the the correction system uh, and the workforce systems, right? Two massive systems um, in the state, um, 
you know, and, and, you know, looking at our partners right across the table and, you know, just really thinking, you know, what do they have to offer, right? How, 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 how are we going to help each other? How, you know, we, we have our workload, we're, we're all busy, you know, how are we going to interact? How are they going to help us? How are we going to help them? Um, but really, you know, we sat down and we found a lot of common ground uh, and have come a long ways together. And we really wanted to set that example at the state level, um, because as, as you all know, who do this work, that's what it takes at the local level, right? It's not any one of us individually uh, or by ourselves or just our organization um, that's part of the solution. It's, it's really working together. So we really wanted to model that at the state level um, because we expect nothing less uh, at the local and community level. And there was also, you know, I think at, at least speaking for myself, you know, some fear on both sides um, that that what we we're doing or what we we're planning or, you know, that this grant program, you know, would, would be just another boutique grant program, right? And I think those of us, you know, who've, who've been around a while, right, know, know, know what that means, right? It's here today, gone tomorrow, the resources disappear, and then we all just go back to our corners. Um, but as Brant mentioned earlier, we've really fought to keep this work going uh, through lots of changes, uh, global pandemic, right, that shook up all of our systems and all of our lives. And, uh, and we need more state partners. You know, I saw that there are a lot of friends um, joining us today from the Department of Rehabilitation. Um, they provide excellent services. I know that you know, a lot of them have been active in the chat, you know, in the regions that they're, that they're active in. Um, they provide excellent services. Uh, and there's a lot of crossover, you know, between the, the communities and, and really our goals are the same, right? There's a lot of alignment that we can move forward together. Um, I saw, you know, from, from registration and even the chat, right? Social services, CalWORKs, uh, Energy, Cal Fire, right? The state agencies, let's collaborate um, towards shared goals, right? Join us. Um, there's a lot we can do. Um, there's still a lot of promise with and, and the need from state agencies for skilled workers, right? And our ability to connect people on the inside uh, of our state prisons to state jobs uh, once they exit, it, it has a lot of potential to, to scale and expand. Um, you know, we talked about some of the recent activities and, you know, while that's not on a wide scale, you know, really it's, it's pretty amazing when you think about it, right? We've, we've proved that it can be done. You know, Dave, Dave said it earlier with, with his project uh, in Motherload, right? People were like, oh, you'll never get, you know, Cal jobs in the prison, right? And, and they did it, right? And same thing, right? We, we were able to, you know, have, you know, folks who are incarcerated take state exams you know, get interviews, right, and get hired uh, upon release. And, you know, we, we started kind of with, uh, with the paths that were immediately identifiable and where there's a lot of need in Caltrans for highway maintenance workers. Um, I know that some folks have, you know, gone into janitorial jobs and there's so many other good state jobs that we could target. Um, there are also a number of quality jobs within our local governments. Uh, and we need to look deeper at what some of our local governments are doing, like LA City, um, LA County and Alameda County, right? I know are, are active and, and we're looking at what they're doing. Uh, and, and if you're in those regions, I, I hope you are too, right? And if not, you know, connect with them and let's, let's figure out, you know, how we can do that also. Um, you know, you just heard uh, uh, Mother Lode, you know, was talking about, you know, water agencies in their regions. There's, you know, special districts, there's local governments, there's, there's a ton of, you know, quality jobs out there that we can connect folks with. Um, you know, overall, we, we need to do more to connect the training, education, and work experience on the inside uh, to the labor demand on the outside. Right. And, and, and there's a willingness. I think that's that's the most important. Right. You heard from our partners um, in the Division of Rehabilitative Programs, you know, at Cal PIA. Um, there's there's a lot you know, going on in terms of training and education on the inside and work experience. Uh, what does that translate to? Right. We can learn 
um, a lot more from our local partners and community partners on how to align that work on the inside um, to lead to better uh, outcomes uh, when people come home. Um, we're also partnered here at the at the Workforce Development Board uh, with UC Riverside uh, for evaluation on this first round of investment uh, for prison to employment. Uh, and I know uh, Dr. Baker is you know, one of our, our, our researchers here is, is really, you know, going to be working. And we're looking, um, you know, forward to learning more uh, from that evaluation work, um, both from them and from Dr. Baker, who are looking at the numbers. Uh, to really build um, a, a system of continuous and intentional improvement um, with, with the grant program. But, you know, I think you all have heard today that P2E is a lot more than just a grant program. A grant program is, is, is absolutely important, um, but there's, there's so much that's being done in the partnership work that's not, you know, that's not directly funded um, by a grant. And I know for a fact that, you know, P2E isn't the only grant here at the Workforce Development Board uh, who provide these critical services uh, to our formerly incarcerated and justice-involved community in California. Uh, I put a I put a, a link earlier, you know, to some videos uh, on on the CWDB YouTube channel um, that talk about our high road construction careers, right, and and our partnerships there. Uh, in the trades and, and amazing organizations uh, who we partner with, who are part of HRCC, uh, and some of whom, you know, are, you know, are, are more connected uh, to the community uh, than we are and who can provide these services. Um, and so, you know, we need to do more to learn from our other grant initiatives uh, here at the, at the Workforce Development Board. Um, our Removing Barriers to Employment program our high road trading partnerships, our high road construction careers, and our uh, workforce accelerator programs. Uh, there's there's so much more crossover, and I think we need to, you know, spend more time. And those of you, you know, who might be involved in those programs too, we need we need to build more connectivity, um, and and braid these services. I also know that there are people out there, um, communities and organizations. Who are just who are doing incredible work every day, uh, and are not part of this particular grant program um, or other CWDB initiatives, and we really need to bridge this gap. Uh, so, if you're out there participating, if you're listening to this today, you know, please reach out to us uh, and talk to us about what you're doing, uh, and learn more about our other initiatives um, here at the CWDB and how. Um, how, you know, how we can work together on those. Uh, there are people out there who've been doing uh, this work long before this grant came about. And I just want to acknowledge you uh, and know that, you know, we, we see you and we understand you know, there are people who do it without government funding. Uh, there are people who do it not because of government funding, you know, who do it for all the right reasons, right? Who for a long time, have chosen light over darkness uh, and who really deserve our state support. Uh, and we need to connect uh, and we need to do that hard work together. Um, here at the CWDB, you know, we don't want to just train and pray <laughs> with these precious public dollars um, that we have invested here. You know, the traditional model uh, is to get people some skills or education and then send them into competitive labor markets to fend for themselves and hope that you know, something sticks uh, and hope that they make it on their own. But we all know that far too often and with the legal and structural barriers against our community members, that this far too often results in, in a race to the bottom. You know, it can be rife with exploitation, wages that don't sustain families, poor job quality, a lack of dignity, and, and no upward mobility. Uh, that's the low road, and that's, that's what we want to avoid here. You know, and, and I know that a lot of people say that any job is a good job to get back on your feet, and, and I get that. I, I acknowledge that. Um, but we really have to find the high road here, too, and commit to quality jobs. 
equity, and climate resiliency is, is part of this. And we have to start with the best jobs. We have to start with quality jobs. And we need to build pathways for our people into those jobs because we know that some of the best employees are not just overlooked, but they're systemically locked out of prosperity and real economic justice. And we can do better. You know, the nearly, uh, nearly 800 people um, joined us, you know, registered for this summit today. And that says something, you know, we have a long way to go and we need to do it together. And I think all of us see some great progress. And I just want to say that this is, this is a foundation, right? We we're building the foundation with this first round of investment. And uh, the 2021-22 state budget uh, provided an additional 20 million to build upon this foundation. And the uh, solicitation for the second round of funds, I think Tim mentioned it earlier, uh, is expected to be released later this spring uh, or, or June at the latest. So, so, you know, stay tuned, keep connected with us and, and um, that, 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 you know, that fund will be available uh, later this spring. And we're discussing a, a similar strategy uh, of providing regional funding um, in this second round. Uh, and we're also looking at how to make sure that you know, community-based organizations are part of this solution. Uh, we need to figure out how we can improve and better serve you uh, with our state partnerships with, with CDCR, with CalPIA. You know, let's bring in our partners at DOR and other state agencies. Um, so, you know, connect and, and tell us what's working with our grants, uh, what can be improved. Um, tell us about your relationships with the local workforce development system and how we can align partnerships and resources. Uh, as you've heard today, you know, our local workforce development partners, uh, our local boards, uh, AJCCs or One Stops, uh, they're, they're in your communities uh, and they have a lot to offer. And for the, you know, for the public workforce system, there are main, you know, system uh, providers. And so if you don't have a relationship with your local workforce board or AJCC, you know, form one. Uh, and let's leverage each other's resources. Uh, they're incredible partners uh, and they're here to serve you. And if, and if there's issues, you know, come to us, you know, reach out uh, to the boards. Um, you know, our experience is, you know, they're, they're, more than willing to, to, to partner up and, and to help serve. And, you know, if, if not, you know, reach out to us at the state board also. Um, take a look at our CWDB website. You know, like I said, find out more about our other initiatives, uh, our opportunities to connect and ways to coordinate service delivery. You know, people who, who, who work with us, um, they'll attest that, you know, here at the, at the work, state workforce board, uh, we don't fund and pray. You know, we don't just put money out on the street and, and hope that good people will do good things and then you know, write us a report uh, and, and just tell us you know, what we want to hear later. Um, we build partnerships at the Workforce Development Board. In fact, uh, we, we forge partnerships uh, because partnerships ain't easy. Uh, and if they are easy, you know, maybe they're not being done right. Um, you know, we, we really want to partner with people and organizations who, who share our mission. And the new CWDB mission statement reads, uh, and, and I'll quote it, right? The, the CWDB forges partnerships with business, labor, and government to build a high road economy defined by equity, quality jobs, and climate resiliency that challenges systemic barriers towards shared economic prosperity. That's who we are uh, at the Workforce Development Board. That's our purpose. And if that's who you are, then we want to partner with you. You know, we, we together, we need to make this mission a reality. Uh, so reach out and, and let's make it happen. And I'll just close with, you know, our administration uh, is pursuing a California for all. Uh, and we and the legislature have put the resources at the Workforce Development Board to back up our promise. So let's work to you know, let's work together. Let's let's build 
a California economy that's defined by equity, quality jobs, and, and climate resiliency. So thanks again for joining us today. Uh, thank you for all that you do every day, and, and let's keep up the progress. Thank you, Curtis. Thank you for those words, especially our updated mission statement. Uh, Russ, if you can share screen the idea boards for th this uh, panel section, there is a couple of questions, Curtis, uh, to address from the field. Uh, let's give Russ a couple of seconds to share screen that. There we go. We have the most upvoted one. Will you provide a contact info list of today's 800 participants? I know, I got, let me take that one first. Uh, I know we have collected a significant amount of emails, so we'll put that into our master um, contact list. So when new, new initiatives and new uh, updated info goes out to the field, we have your email, you will be on our, our constant contact list. Uh, and then Curtis, I think I see, are there any new initiatives in the works to address better housing for the uh, P2E population similar to the P2E model? Uh, that was an upvoted question. And then I think uh, you answered the next upvoted, uh, the next next round, so. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take a shot at the at the housing question. I mean, in, incredible question, right? And it's, and it's um, you know, it's a, it's a critical supportive service, right? And, and it's an allowable use of supportive services uh, in our grant program, um, but as far as you know, specific programs, I know that there is a fund over at the Board of State and Community Corrections um, that is specifically looking at housing uh, for justice involved. Uh, so if you're not familiar with that, um, take a look. It's uh, bscc.ca.gov, uh, Board of State and Community Corrections. Uh, and I know that uh, I think some legislation has been introduced also. Uh, and I think we're going to be sitting down uh, with another partner state agency soon, I hope, uh, over at uh, BCSH, um, Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency, um, to, to look at some housing um, options uh, for, for this community. Um, and so, yeah, I know that there's an active grant program at BSCC. Um, and, I, and I agree, we, we need to do more. Uh, and as for the, the, the second round of funding, um, you know, looking at, we're looking at spring uh, at the very latest early summer uh, that we'll be releasing that. Okay, great. Uh, there's another question. I'll, I'm going to read it as presented. How can the P2E be leveraged to establish a cross-sector of reentry system of care? Caring, uh, centering workforce talent development and higher education system interventions for reentry success. Can the next reiteration of the P2E Center on Community Partners Innovation? Yeah, no, that's that's uh, that's an excellent excellent question. Um, and I know that there are uh, a number of folks, uh, us, and a number of state agencies uh, who are looking at uh, coordinated case management. I mean, that's kind of the the role we play here uh, at the at the CWDB uh, as a convener um, between multiple systems. Uh, I know that LA County um, had been looking at it. Um, you know, uh, across systems is, is difficult, right? I mean, we're you know, there's there are a lot of silos uh, in in government, um, and and really, you know, we need to work to break those down. And I think, you know, we we have a foundation here. Right, uh, starting you know with our partnership with CDCR, which is why I said we need to bring in more state partners. Um, you know our our systems. It's not you know it's not exactly a system of coordinated case management, right? But CDCR, um, you know, uh, adult parole operations, right, in their pivots referral system, right, did include us, right? It's not perfect. We we still got to work on it. You know we we'd love to automate it. You know, shout out to our friends in LA County. Uh, we. We we share that goal, right? Let's let's make that happen, um, you know. But and and so there is some, you know, some cross system there. And you know, do we need more? Yeah, you know. And are there other state systems and state programs uh, that are being administered? You know, where we're serving, you know, similar goals and we're serving the same community. Yeah, you know. And 
we need to work. We need to work better together. We need to break down those silos. Um, and you know, with, with state data systems, uh, they 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 you know, there's some challenges uh, um, there, right? Especially on the front end uh, in coordinating across systems. Um, and uh, that's not going to deter us, right? It's just we need to sit down and really, you know, work together to find solutions. Uh, and I think you know the you know, the footprints of that, right, the, the start of that has has really been shown, you know, here too, you know, it's really exciting to see, you know, what Motherload did. And, you know, yes, they did that, you know, with, with their grant funds, you know, and, and probably one of the smallest uh, workforce regions of our state, um, but that could have statewide implications and it will have statewide implications. Uh, and that, that's the type of work and innovation um, that we need to continue to support and, and build on as a foundation for this. Yeah, just wanted to step in. Uh, another one of the upvoted questions was whether the evaluation work from UC Riverside will be used to inform the next round of P2E. Um, and I, I'm going to take a first stab at that. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the answer is absolutely. Um, uh, UC Riverside has, has been uh, involved with us for about a year and a half now. Uh, we've been under uh, contract. And um, um, as, as you all know, right, rigorous evaluation work, uh, you know, especially quantitative analysis takes time, right? Uh, the, the, the data that we're going to be using on that evaluation um, is still going to take about a year to, to, to fully come in. You know, all, all of the participants' uh, wage and employment data uh, has, has that one-year lag. Um, but um, the, the preliminary analyses and especially the qualitative work that UC Riverside has been doing for us um, interviewing uh, uh, case managers and inter interviewing uh, grant, grant managers around the state and, and not just uh, case managers and, and uh, program managers, but the actual participants, you know, that, that they really wanted to go from the participant side of the, of the story and from, from their perspectives on improvements that, that could be made. Um, um, so, so while we won't have the full final, you know, with a bow wrapped up on it, uh, evaluation report for about another year, we're already getting preliminary insights, uh, uh from them that, that will definitely be, be, be useful for, for figuring out better ways to run P2E in the, in the next, um, uh, uh, round. And I know Curtis may I'll hand it back to you for just kind of other sources that we're using. I mean, this, this uh, summit right here is one of the most important uh, uh, forums that, that we would plan on, on hearing uh, uh, for, for, for what could be better in the next round. So Curtis. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the, the great things I, I wasn't quite uh, um, expecting and I'm certainly excited to see her today, right? The, the the level of um, of activity in the chat, you know, I think Travis said it earlier, right? The chat's on fire. Um, you know, the the board um, that uh, the team here put together uh, for people, you know, to to ask questions, right? To connect. Uh, I saw a lot of folks, you know, connecting, and so, you know, I, I think, um, you know, it's it, it's great, right? And and I look at it as a challenge to us uh, at the state board and our team. Right, how to keep up the momentum, how to build on that, um, and how to how to use you know what um, you know the amazing stuff that happened today, uh, and all of you uh, who joined us today, right, to keep connected, right. What does that next step look like, um, and and how you know how how can we how can we connect and, and support you in better ways? I look at it as a challenge for us, so you know I'm I'm excited to you know to to see. I haven't been able to track. Now, every comment in the chat, you know, but we'll be looking at it um, and, uh, you know, and with our partners, right? And, um, and making sure that, you know, we involve you um, uh, and, that, uh, and that we keep up this momentum. Uh, you know, I, like I said, I look at it as a, as a challenge for us uh, and, that's, and that's exciting. Well, thank you, Curtis. I think we're going to, this is a perfect opportunity to uh, end today's discussion. But as we just mentioned a little while ago, the chat has been on fire. So we'll keep the Zoom on for a few more moments after we, we do our final goodbyes. Uh, and then that will give the ability to export and then we'll post that onto the summit page. And I saw people putting, uh, you know, their email contact and all that good information. So if for the folks who are still on the line with us, if you want to do that, so then we have that record of it. 
um, we will we'll keep the Zoom chat online. So, like as the kids would say, please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You know, hit the notification bell. Uh, I say that facetiously, but you know, we did have a couple of video content that uh, from the Labor Secretary giving a, a welcoming message to all of us who are joining us today. So we'll definitely be sharing that not only to the to the. Um, uh, summit page but across our social media feeds it is going to be these same social media feeds as as we have announcements in the spring and the summer not only p2e uh, uh um initiatives but across all of our sister initiatives here at cwdb so please like and subscribe uh and be notified on uh those uh, I want to thank, uh, as Curtis did, I want to thank our CWDB admin team. It takes a lot of logistics to do the stuff in the background. Uh, so I want to acknowledge them. I want to acknowledge all of our panels today, you know, starting with Tim, Brant, Joseph, Rusty, Ryan, Kristen, Alfredo, uh, Dave, Michael, Diana, Miss Wendy, Mr. Eric, James, Curtis, uh, you know, uh, this is just just but a snapshot of what's going on out in the state of California, and we just wanted to one as this next month is the the the, the two year grant initiative. This part is coming to a close, but that does not mean that this work is going to close. We have many many partners at the statewide level that we're going to be in many conversations. It is not siloed anymore. We're going to see how we can align. Uh, our state uh, partnerships team into these discussions to help out all communities uh, that are impacted, especially the justice involved community. And that's, you know, and so that goes to a big cross section. Uh, Angela, do you have any final words you want to say to the field team? I, I know you, you all are very familiar with Angela and her team. We want to thank, um, you know, Angela and her team. Uh, it's been a it's been a journey, and we're we're so happy how today has uh, came out. We're so happy that the discussions we've had three four years ago to be at this seat today to see it all come true. We vision board many aspects of what this grant initiative was going going to do, and I think we've hit all of them. And I know I want to acknowledge Mike, Rafa, Dan Rounds, all the others who used to be in uh, in our seats. Uh, as a collaborative team, uh, and they're off in other uh, areas. You know, it's it all those discussions that we've had. It's so worth it, and and you saw it with Wendy. You saw it with Eric. So with that, we'll put our final slides. We are gonna. We do have your email, so we'll do in the next in the coming days. We will have a survey out to see how we did. Hopefully, we did well. Um, yeah, we're going to keep the conversation going. We'll keep the Zoom on to put all your contact info. We'll post everything on our summit page over the next few days. And with that, we thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And we will go on mute. Thank you very much, everybody.